Happy to say hi. You put in your camera if you want to say hello, Max. I can see you live. Yeah. Good morning, my co-moderator of today. Yeah. How are you in Brussels? Yeah. The weather is nice. The sun is shining. And how is the weather in yeah. Berlin? Start with. Well, I'm not in Berlin at the moment. I'm in Amsterdam, and I must say it's not that shiny at the moment. But I hope the good weather will come this way. Uh, let's yes. hope that also in Berlin the weather will be fine. Very good. I, I think so. Uh, but uh, you'll hear that shortly. I'm sure many people from Berlin are joining, but not only from Berlin, because many people are joining in from the EU and beyond. There are even uh, 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 a lot of people from other countries. So we'll reveal a little bit in, from what countries all people are coming from. So welcome to this uh, digital forum on uh, the urban agenda, culture and cultural heritage uh, main stakeholder event. Uh, fantastic. We are building up the connection, Mark, don't we? And we will start at 9. Yes, we are. Uh, but before that, I think there is actually an opportunity to do some checks, not only of the uh, chat function, which is also very important. We chat function will remain open throughout the meeting. You can find it on the right side uh, down for most colleagues. And we will look as much as possible throughout today and tomorrow to see what you want to contribute. Very good. But we also have a polling function, and I think there are some questions waiting to be answered. Uh, for instance, you know, the first question we already talked about, but I think we are curious to check. So perhaps we can uh, see whether there is room for a polling question already to just warm up a little bit. Those of us. Yeah, some Arthur. we have um, almost 300 participants today, right? So that's, um, that's an enormous audience. And it's, uh, of course, this is a, um, well, it's not entirely new to have virtual conferences, of course, but for us to work in, di in, in different places with people from all around Europe, but that's uh, quite fascinating. Uh, but yes. let's see with the technicians if we can already show the first Slido question. This is something that we will be using throughout the day uh, to ask uh, questions and to involve you as much as possible, the audience, um, by asking questions, by allowing you to give input. Um, but indeed, here's the first question. So let's ask with the question that John Martin just asked me. How is the weather in why, where you are currently located? We'll give you one minute to, ask and to answer this difficult question. Go ahead. Oh, wow. I already see some first results, but uh, we'll show it to the audience uh, in a second. Partly sunny, partly cloudy. Well, mostly sunny on this uh, beautiful November day. And it's uh, we don't see rain, and we don't see snow, we don't see storm. But it may be that <laughs> our from India, Pakistan, or Ecuador are not with us. I think it's not snowing in Ecuador, probably, although there are mountains. But uh, yeah. mostly Europe today, and that's a good start for the conference, uh, indeed. Very good. Okay. Now you said one minute, uh, Mart. So it means indeed that there is a slot to uh, answer the question. Um, I assume also it is for the other questions. One minute. Do you know more details about that? Uh? Well, we have we have various questions actually, and the poll questions mean they can be relatively fast, of course. Uh, but perhaps it's good also to explain a bit uh, how the audience can be involved throughout today. What I said, we have uh, we will be using Slido. Uh, we have poll questions like this one about the weather, uh, but we also have questions where you can enter a word, uh, and that will create this word cloud that you that most of you, I'm sure, are are familiar with. Uh, that's also a good possibility. Uh, and then uh, we have the opportunity for you also to uh, to ask questions in the uh, chat, actually. And uh, Jan Maarten and me, as moderators, we will have a close look at the chat during the day uh, and to uh, to pick up questions from the chat. So there are different possibilities for you to remain involved. Does my microphone work? Good morning. Yes, it's good morning, Carlos. Yeah, yeah, we don't even need to see you to hear your voice, indeed. So loud and clear. Thank you very much. Good morning. And where are you based today, Valius? Valius is back to mute. Very good. OK. But also other panelists or speakers who would like to double check, feel free. We still have nine minutes before start. And perhaps we can take another question also just uh, to warm you up indeed. Well, I would say let's take the next uh, Slido question then, uh, which gives us a bit of an idea of where people come from. Um, 
So let's see with our technicians in Berlin. We need to switch from city to city indeed. Um, but please, technicians, if you can show the next question indeed. In which country are you currently located? Uh, and this will create a word cloud, as I already mentioned before. So it's building up now, indeed. Let's wait a bit more for to get more results. This is about cities also, right? So uh, do you know where Hivinka is, uh, is uh, what? Well, looking at the spelling of these words, my first guess would be that it would be in yeah. Finland, indeed. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 But it is not a very large, and I love, okay, it helps Helsinki, it is Helsinki in Finnish. Okay, very good. I think that was uh, um, exactly. yeah. very good, very good, very good. But it seems almost Helsinki in Swedish, but okay, we here. And Zotekem, yes, uh, very well, that's also a, a town. Uh, not a very large town, but actually I do know there's an intercity train that goes to Zotekem. So it can't be that small here in Belgium also. And indeed, we have Berlin, Germany, prominently. We have Athens, indeed, in Greece, and uh, we see many more places coming up. Uh, Bucharest, yes, we do know we have people in Romania, but also very good to see a little bit better flavor where you are coming from. Which, by the way, is also visible at the brochure. Everybody has been provided with a brochure, uh, which is, of course, a, a beautiful document. I warmly recommend it to look. And that is, and it's becoming rare these days. There is actually a list of participants added, and you will see the 300 people and their names uh, in, in, in the end. Okay, good morning, Spain. Uh, in the chat, very good welcome, and Torino as well. So, uh, and indeed, Anna Laura Orico, it's a pleasure to have you from Rome, indeed, and uh, it's very good uh, to um, have you with us, uh, and we will shortly uh, uh, interview you in the panel, in indeed. So, that's very good, and uh, I think, indeed, uh, everything is working, right? So, uh, most people, I guess, are familiar with WebEx these days, so this may be a slightly, there are various WebEx versions, so this version maybe slightly different one, you know. So if you have any questions or problems, uh, feel free to, to check the buttons, also the buttons on the top. Make sure that the installation is uh, fitting you best as possible. We will keep the, 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 the chat open, uh, Mart, but indeed um, um, we'll do it together because it's a exactly. lot better. And in that sense, it's very good that we're all in this together and that we can... Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's actually, it's a good idea, Martin, to check with a few panelists. I mean, everything is working. We have people in Berlin in a real studio. Yes, um, and we have, uh, yeah, so good morning, Berlin. Um, and we have guests in Italy, in Rome, in Brussels, more in Rome. I see a nice Italian flag. Good morning. That must be you, uh, Ana Laura Orico. Good morning. Yes, good, good morning. morning. Everybody. Good, morning. good morning. Yeah, just also to check a bit your, the sound quality that functions so well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's, have you. let's quickly check a bit also the sound quality with the other panelists. It's Mr. Gary Wob also. He's in the studio right in Berlin. Good morning, Mr. Wob. In Berlin. Greetings from Berlin from here. Yes. Good to see you uh, this morning. Good to, see, good, to, good to see you too. Good morning. And such a uh, pleasure in the studio. Let's also, yeah. Let's also check with uh, our colleague, another colleague in Brussels, Norman Popens. Norman, are you there? Not yet? Okay, he will join in the mid later then, I suppose. Yes, yes, for sure. Uh, Excellent. Okay, so this is a meeting of the Urban Agenda Culture and Culture Heritage Partnership. And did you know, Mart, uh, how many cities and regions and countries actually take part in this partnership? I counted them last night. Yes. Five, five member states, also five regions and ten cities. And I think the cities have beautiful names. And if you have a minute, I mean, I'd love to read them. Probably I mispronounce it, but I want to let you know that we have people in the partnership from... Alba Iulia, that's in Romania, from Berlin, Bordeaux, in Espo in, in Finland, uh, Firenze in Italy, but also from Giormala, that's in Latvia, 
Katowice in Poland, Kazanlak, which is in Bulgaria, Murcia in Spain, Nagia Kanisa in Hungary, and Ubeda in Spain. So it's an enormous diversity already of cities, but also the regions are, I think, very uh, nice part of this partnership. We have the Las Canarias, the Canary Islands, also the yeah. Poim region in Portugal, the Flemish region, uh, the Ljubljana region in Slovenia, and also the Silesian Voivodeship. And also member states, why not mention them also? We have Cyprus and France and Greece. And of course, this partnership is coordinated by the Italian National Government Agency for Territorial Cooperation. And uh, of course, our host of today, the Federal Ministry of the Interior of Germany. Uh, Ministry of Interior, but also building and community, which is a very interesting combination one, because it's not in many countries that we see that combination. That may be a very exciting start also when we start shortly with uh, our, 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 our main our first uh, guest and host of the day. Good morning, everybody. It's 9.27 in uh, our time zone, which is the Central European time. Not everybody is in time zone. Some people may be hours and hours ahead of us, for instance, our participants from India, Pakistan. And I wonder whether our participant from Ecuador is already with us, because at this moment it is 3.27 in the morning in Ecuador, in Quito. Which is a bit it's very early this. indeed. Yeah, it is. Yes, yeah, so perhaps you mentioned, and of course, me today we'll be talking a lot about the urban agenda for the EU. But we also prepared this quick slide of question about the urban agenda, and perhaps with the Let's support of our technicians in Berlin, Let's do another poll, uh, technicians in Berlin. Um, and the question actually is a simple one, of course. Have you heard about the urban agenda for the EU before this conference? Very good. All right. Okay, I see the number of people that have not heard about the urban agenda is now decreasing, uh, but it's, uh, oh, well, I shouldn't have said that, of course. It's increasing again, but it's okay. Still, we need to, uh, we have uh, a mission to, uh, to accomplish, uh, colleagues, today. We have about 17% of the audience that has not heard yet about the urban agenda for the EU. Well, believe me, today and tomorrow, you will hear a lot about it, and at the end of the day, you know everything about at least this partnership, which is one of the current 14 partnerships of the urban agenda for the EU. Excellent, yes. And that's very good because the urban agenda is for and by all cities uh, of Europe and even beyond. So the more that people can reach out to, the better it is indeed. Good, okay, excellent. So we have now 84 people in the, in the call already. I think it's 9.29. The idea is, ladies and gentlemen, that we try to be uh, punctual today, which is not easy, but uh, you know we, it's quite a commitment for all of us. It's long for this kind of meetings, so let's make an effort together to be on time and to also to end on time. And indeed, uh, we'll go through the program very shortly. And I think indeed, as it is 9:29, we can shortly start. And I think there are more questions, but you know, let's do them later. Meanwhile, we can learn more about Zotikem in uh, in the chat. So that's uh, thank you very much for that. And it's very good. Good. So uh, I think we can start at 9.30. So good morning. My name is Jan-Martin de Vett. I'm from ECORIS. I've been heading the technical secretariat for the Urban Agenda. And it's a real, real pleasure to be with you here today with my dear, dear, dear colleague and friend, Mart Grisel from EU Korea. Hello, Mart. Yes. Hello, Jan Martin. Indeed, it's a big pleasure. Uh, we have been working together, but yeah, this for yeah. us also is absolutely new to co-moderate uh, a conference uh, today. Uh, I'm the director of the European Urban Knowledge Network. With Jan Martin, we have been working uh, in support uh, of the so uh, technical secretariat for the urban agenda for the EU. Uh, and uh, we have been involved in uh, the establishment and the further uh, rollout of the urban agenda for the EU. Uh, in uh, in our cooperation with member states across Europe. Excellent. Yes, Amart, I think it's about time to start the conference, right? Uh, so yes, uh, let's let's have the slides. Let's see the first uh, slides uh, of indeed uh, our presentation. So uh, it's good to have the slide back. We saw the slide a moment ago, so it's good to have it back. Um, do you see the slide, Mart, already? Not yet. Welcome, slide. Okay, let's have Studio Five. Hello, Studio Five. Yes, very there good. It is. So, why are we here together? Uh, before that, I think you saw a slide that we have indeed 290 people from uh, many, many countries. And I wanted to name the countries outside the EU uh, that signed up for this conference to show you that 
indeed it's not only about the EU. So we have people from Norway, Pakistan, Turkey, Algeria, Ecuador, India and the UK, all countries outside of the European Union. Very good. So why have we come together here? Uh, well, there is a reason. Uh, the reason actually of this partnership, uh, what this vision is, and the vision is that culture and cultural heritage are not just there for the sake of culture and cultural heritage. No, they are seen as tools, as drivers to build better cities. And we will explain, uh, you will hear from the various speakers today uh, how that will work. But also, very, very important, that culture and cultural heritage, as you can read in the big document in the action plan and the many other documents, can be a cornerstone for sustainable urban development. And especially now, in these times, where the resilience and the attractiveness of cities is being tested. We are all living through a time of, uh, still a, a time of the pandemic, already for month and month, and even though there's light at the end of the tunnel, we really start thinking what all of this does to our cities also. So let's seize the opportunity today and tomorrow also to think what the pandemic and its aftermath will do to cities. So it could well be that, uh, for instance, digitization means that we are going to work more from home. Do we still want to be in the cities or do we actually prefer to go outside? Do we want to live in rural areas, in suburban areas? It may well be, if you think this through, that culture and cultural heritage becomes even more important to keep our cities attractive. So it's very, very good to, uh, to think about that altogether. And indeed, we see in the chat not only the countries I mentioned, but we have also participants from Australia. Wow, that is fantastic. So what are we going to do uh, in the conference? Um, next slide, please. We are going indeed to, um, uh, to, to achieve, we want to achieve a few things with this forum. And actually there are three objectives to share with you. First of you, uh, it's good to present and discuss with you the partnership action plan. This is a long document, but it's a very, very good document. And it has gone through already various rounds of approval by the various um, uh, formal circuits, but also it's very good to celebrate right now that this action plan is ready to go. So it's good to know what's in there, but also, and that's the next stage in this work on the urban agenda, to actually start implementing these actions. And there are not less than 11 actions foreseen in the action plan. And getting the momentum to get going with those actions is super important. So we want to build with you that momentum and to get this action through in what is hopefully going to be a wonderful year 2021. But also, uh, the idea is to reflect on European culture and cultural heritage with an international audience. So we have in Brussels, uh, especially, but also in Europe, sometimes a tendency to look inward. We think Europe is the world. Well, Europe is part of the world, but there is so much out there. And if you think about European culture and cultural heritage. Let's take that international perspective, and we will do that indeed. So uh, that is uh, the, the main aim. So we'll see whether we succeed. When we manage to do this, then I think we can speak of a successful conference indeed. So what, are, what is the program then for uh, today and tomorrow? But it is a, it's, it's a busy program, but we have carefully designed it. And we will start shortly with a panel discussion with four political dignitaries and high-level speakers who will actually directly be interviewed. They will get questions about culture and cultural heritage as a key for urban development. Then after that, we will actually hear a bit more about Urban Agenda's partnership on culture and cultural heritage in the context of the new Leipzig Charter. Very important moment because only in a couple of days, also in Berlin, uh, ministers will come together uh, to actually sign off this new Leipzig Charter uh, already more than 10 years after the original one. Very important. And this partnership works also in that context. We'll hear more about it at 2025. And then we'll have another panel discussion uh, uh, shortly after 11. If all goes well, we'll have a little break in between. And then we will actually talk exactly about the role of European culture and culture in that international dimension. So we'll have speakers and panelists with us who actually have that broad view. After the lunchtime, bear in mind, we are in, uh, on the Berlin clock, so we have early German lunches. For those of you who are in time zones, it's good to bear in mind. So from 12 o'clock to one o'clock, the idea is to have a one hour break. We really hope we can have that break. 
and you can have that break, uh, so that indeed we can be fresh at one o'clock. And then we will go into interactive presentations uh, and workshops. We will hear more about those 11 actions, and they have been very smartly grouped in four blocks or strategies. And then you are all invited to join uh, in the workshop. There is a lot of freedom today. You can, just by clicking one link, you can choose the strategy, you can choose the discussion you want to share. And it's indeed shortly after four o'clock that we want to end. That is enough for a virtual day. We have two serious blocks and in between a good break. So let's make that work. But also tomorrow, we still have um, a quite a few important things to do. So we will come back to you with the report on the results in the workshops. Always when you have these breakout groups, you always, I have myself a lot of what I call FOMO, fear of missing out, especially in conferences like this. So that can be actually addressed. We will hear back tomorrow morning what problems or what issues and results are coming out of those workshops. Then we will, of course, present and discuss the conclusions of the action plan. So people are working behind the scene to really try to capture right now what is the essence of the discussion of the action plan? What is it uh, that we want to uh, share with you? And will you actually live up to that as well? Very interesting. We will have at the end a keynote, the speaker, uh, 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 who will share with us uh, really interesting thinking about balanced cities in disruptive times. Beautiful title. And I look forward to that uh, keynote speech already. And then, of course, we will have at 11.50 tomorrow, closing remarks, if all goes well. And indeed, that's the uh, one and a half day forum. So I think that's all I wanted to say right now uh, to, to you. Uh, thank you all for being with us again, many people. I think it's uh, time much to, uh, to start off with the panel and I give the floor to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Yamata. Um, yes, our nine, next time slot for the next 40 minutes is a uh, political discussion with uh, high level representatives. We're very happy that all of you uh, are available today. Let me briefly present you for those of you who are interested in the biographies. I refer to the excellent conference booklet that has been prepared, which has extensive biographies of all the speakers. But I'd like to introduce you the four uh, participants in our panel discussion. First uh, and foremost, anna Katrin Bohle. She is the figurehead now of the German presidency as state secretary of the, uh, the Federal Ministry of the Interior, Building and Community. Good morning, uh, Ms. Bohle. Uh, we look forward to uh, having your insights in the German presidency program uh, during the day. And then we have also from Berlin, Mr. Gary Woop, who is the Permanent Secretary of Europe at the Berlin Senate Department for Culture and Europe. So actually working very uh, intensely at the, uh, at the core of the topic that we will be discussing today. And then we're moving to Rome, where we have Anna Laura Orico, uh, who is State Secretary at the Ministry of cultural heritage and tourism. So we see indeed that in Italy you do have a ministry of cultural heritage, which is perhaps one of the unique uh, ministries having that particular name, at least as far as I know. And then we have from Brussels, and he also just joined, Mr. Norman Poppins, who is the deputy director at the DG Reggio, uh, the, uh, the DG in the European Commission, very, very closely involved in the making and the further enrollment of the urban agenda. I will start the first round of discussions, uh, and I would like to start with you, Ms. Borlem. Uh, as you know, of course, uh, during the second half of this year, the uh, Germany holds the presidency of the European Council. I would like to ask you, what have been the main priorities regarding urban matters during your presidency? And which role do urban matters actually play uh, at, the, uh, at this European level? And what is the role of the urban agenda for the EU in this period? I would like to give you the floor for around four minutes for our answers, please. Go ahead. So, hello and good morning, Mr. Griesel. And uh, first of all, welcome to everyone at the screens. And uh, we really wanted to welcome you in, in Berlin physically. And we wanted to stay at uh, Tempelhof, uh, architectural uh, highlight in, in, in Berlin. But uh, 
the time is as the time is. So therefore, um, it's very sad that you cannot be here physically. But on the other hand, we are very, very happy on that big resonance on our invitation. We've got more than 250 registrations on uh, our conference. So therefore, first of all, a warm welcome to all of you uh, from many countries in Europe and above. So coming back to your questions, I keep the four minutes in mind. So the main priority is adopting the new Leipzig Charter and the implementation document. So for us, and I guess for all of us, the Leipzig Charter is the strategic framework for urban development across Europe for already 13 years by now. So the updated new Leipzig Charter follows those years of the joint urban development policy in Europe. So that's the main point. So the main strategic direction uh, on the new Leipzig Charter is uh, something which is very, very important to me, is the close cooperation for all government levels to ensure, and this is the point, the common good and empowering European cities to shape their transformation. And this is the main point for our presidency. So the common good, uh, it sounds better than the German word Gemeinwohlorientierung. Common good is the new Leipzig Charter's main principle. It's, providing, it's about providing equivalent living conditions for all citizens in its many different shapes. That's the main point. And despite intense discussions at the beginning of the process, the common good has become the flagship of our presidency. So uh, with the adoption of the Pact of Amsterdam in uh, 2016, I believe, and the launch of the Urban yeah. Agenda for the EU, strategic goals in urban development were translated into actions. That is what we do together. And um, we, the Urban Agenda for the EU and the thematic partnership has proven to be a success in strengthening all of us and especially the urban dimension. So uh, it's more urban-friendly European policy by now, and it brings the stakeholders from different governance levels together. That's our main point. And we intend, last sentence, to agree on two documents on our informal meeting of ministers end of November. And it's the new Leipzig Charter, and it's the implementation document for the new Leipzig Charter. And uh, further the de development of the urban agenda of the EU. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Bowen. And I think next week will be an important moment, because then, indeed, the, this new Leipzig Charter and its implementation document will be adopted by the ministers responsible for urban matters. So we're looking forward to that big moment also in urban development. Thank you. Um, I would like to move now to Rome, to Miss Orico. Um, Italy is a fascinating country if we are looking to the urban agenda for the EU. Uh, it has the highest numbers of cities involved in the urban agenda partnerships. It now also coordinates this partnership on culture and cultural heritage. I would like to ask you, Ms. Orico, how do you explain the strong involvement of Italy in the urban agenda for the EU, and then also more specifically, in the one on culture and cultural heritage. Please, the four minutes are yours. Good morning and many thanks to all the attendees for joining the, this conference and to organizers for inviting me. The Italian Ministry of Cultural Heritage is inspiringly committed to enact the urban agenda for the EU, with a specific reference to partnership on culture and cultural heritage, as we value them as a crucial factor to build a better, more inclusive and sustainable Europe. We are very involved in the urban agenda process and extremely interested in the success of the action plan that has been launched today. Let me stress that uh, the new Leipzig Charter is a milestone in order to add toward the common good to safeguard the livability of all European towns and cities and ensure that no one is left behind. We deeply believe in a culture as a driver and enable of a sustainable development and believe that such kinds of events are fundamental to empower our values. 
I think we are facing great challenges. First of all, the ones opposed to our cultural heritage and our lifestyle by climate change, migration, sustainability, security. I deem that thanks to the urban agenda, we can find common answers. As far as the Italian Ministry of Cultural Heritage is concerned, we contribute by offering Europe the vision and expertise that are expressed in projects such as Future Urban Culture, PON, and the extra plan for culture and development, the strategic tourism plan, and many other projects with ambition culture as the engine for aware citizenship. I am particularly committed in stretching the boundaries of our policies, emphasizing the relation between urban and rural areas. The historic experiences of Germany and Italy proves it, consider the case of the Anseatic League and medieval communes. Cultural policies cannot be limited to metropolitan areas, but must be a driver to favor peripheral areas. In Borghi, little Italian communes, there is a great cultural heritage that deserves to be promoted. To this regard, big cities can help small cities. As a consequence, we need a paradigm change. In many cities, we are facing an unsustainable form of tourism, causing enormous anthropic pressure, which affects the quality of the experience for both visitors and residents. Not to mention problems associated with gentrification, which creates a downward pressure on low-income residents, which are ultimately displaced for their neighborhoods. Therefore, we must move toward a different model, human-centered and just. By turning cities into cultural hubs that promote their surroundings, we can expect dramatic changes. For, it, for instance, in Italy there is an interesting debate on so-called the Borghi Renaissance, which implies people coming back to Borghi, little townships where they can afford a better life for cheaper costs. That's why I am personally committed to promoting Borghi, with the objective of spreading good practices based on social regeneration, not only promotion. At this moment in my country, many discussions regarding living and working in South Italian Borghi have flourished. We label as a South working, a mix of smart working and South Italy, a recent trend of people coming back to their small villages in Southern Italy after years of forced urbanization. That's why, uh, that is why the crucial factor to promote a better balance between, a better balance the relation between cities and towns relies on the web revolution and in the new digital and physical infrastructure yet to be built. At any rate, we need a wise governance if we, if we want fairness to prevail. I do believe we are on the right path and culture is crucial to reach this common goal. This event may help us to fine tune our strategies in a synergic approach. That's why I have to thank the organizers. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Ms. Orici. Uh, Orico. Um, you you highlight almost the whole program now in itself, and uh, I can add to, I can add to this that uh, during the day we will be taking specific aspects of what you mentioned, like sustainable tourism, uh, in the workshops uh, later today. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, let's continue a bit with uh, questions about culture uh, and the involvement of cities in this case. Uh, Mr. Wolf, you are representing Berlin, which is both a city and a land in Germany, of course, but. In your motivation letter uh, for the partnership, you wrote that the city wants to give impulses and at the same time also learn from other cities to make the necessary processes as successfully as possible. Uh, you have been involved in the urban partnership, on, uh, on the, in, in the partnership on culture and cultural, cultural heritage for the last two years. Um, can you tell us what makes this cooperation in this partnership 
so specific uh, and how actually have you learned from other cities working in the framework of the urban agenda for the EU? Please, the floor is yours. Good morning. At first, uh, I would like to say thank you for invitation uh, and thank you for organizing uh, this uh, event today, this conference for, for today's uh, debate. So that shows uh, that despite the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, we uh, organize uh, the working process step by step and we, we do what we can do under these um, difficult uh, conditions. And uh, Berlin, I would say, um, is, is, you know, a big city in the middle of Europe and in the middle of the European Union. And so we have a high interest uh, in collaboration with other cities and uh, in exchanging ideas, positions, uh, experiences um, in general. So regarding your, your um, key of the, of the question, um, I would mention three things. Uh, what uh, what we think about uh, this special partnership. We are part of, of three partnerships uh, within the urban agenda. And uh, this special partnership is uh, very interesting for, for my uh, department on uh, for, for culture and Europe. Uh, you can imagine uh, three things, uh, three things um, special uh, for, for our uh, cooperation. First uh, is the concrete scope of the urban agenda on the uh, dimension of policy making. Uh, second, it's the diversity of the network. Uh, you, you know the, the stakeholders on, uh, on the European level, on the national level, and the cities um, itself and, and several networks. And the third point is the structured process, process uh, to achieve the goals uh, that were uh, set. Uh, the scope of the three dimensions of policy making helped help uh, the partnership uh, to achieve notable results um, compared to other networks and provide, I think that's, that's the, the important point, provided um, uh, connectivity on the uh, EU level. For us, uh, it was specifically um, interested to get know to con to get to know uh, the perspective of, in of institutions of other cities of in of networks like um, Euro cities or uh, Urb Act um, and various uh, other cities of, of the European Union with all their different population sizes. Uh, and starting points uh, focusing on, on the questions we, we uh, have on the table. Uh, the urban agenda for the European Union provides a framework uh, that makes it easy to exchange uh, the, the ideas and to get familiar with those several different perspectives of, of the cities. Um, as many various uh, topics as this partnership deals with, it turns uh, us uh, to the uh, uh, to the question um, how we can uh, work uh, in the future. I think um, the structured process was helpful and uh, it can. Uh, uh, going on, and it would be worth to discussing how we can continue the work and um, exchange also uh, the results of the work of uh, several partnerships or working groups within our partnership. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Wolf. Uh, you already mentioned indeed also the importance of uh, future collaboration. Uh, I would like now to move to uh, to Mr. Poppins. Um, Deputy Director General at uh, DG Regio in uh, at the European Commission. I would like to ask you, uh, Mr. Poppins, um, which role do culture and cultural heritage actually play in 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 recent in uh, regional policies uh, within the framework of the of EU uh, collaboration? Uh, not just in regional policies, I would like to ask you, but also in terms of investment programs uh, within the EU. Uh, in, in also as, an, as, as part of a program to revitalize uh, Europe and its cities. Please, if you could answer that question in four minutes, I would be very grateful. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I will try. Um... <laughs> Not very good in short speeches, but I will try. But first, let me thank you and congratulate Anna Catherine and the whole German presidency for uh, carrying through these very important events under the urban and territorial agenda. We would have preferred to be in Tempelhof today, honestly, and in Leipzig uh, a week after, but 
it's impossible, but it's important that we keep doing and, and having these big achievements, I think, under the German presidency happening. So congratulations and, and, and courage, as they say in French here. So we, in, in a cohesion policy, which is, by the way, the biggest investment arm of the EU budget still and will be also, despite the fact that we have a new recovery and resilience facility, cohesion policy will continue investing in our member states, regions, in our urban and rural areas. And of course, culture and cultural heritage will keep featuring in our policy as a big priority. I mean, we have been investing in this field through different uh, types of investment and I'm very happy that we have shifted away from purely and of course if you talk about culture there are different parts of it we know with the cultural heritage which is a self-standing you know um, field where investment is needed but you also talk about culture being part of uh, driving really economic development innovations through the creative industries and investment in such type of uh, you know, SME support um, and all that. And I think we have achieved certain balance when we do support culture and cultural heritage through these different policy objectives that we have. Um, first of all, it is, of course, territorial development. It is supporting endogenous potential of our regions and our territories. And there we talk about support to cultural heritage. Altogether, it's more than six billion in the current period, which goes to culture and cultural heritage. But but I'm also happy to see that more and more we see culture as part of a smart specialization strategies, which means that we are investing in this field through the investment into the field of innovation and support to SMEs. And that is, I think, very important. We have 20 regions which have identified culture and cultural heritage as a big theme for their innovation strategy. So we will keep doing that also in the future. Um, Obviously, there are uh, different uh, different types of projects. I also want to mention cross-border, because I think more and more we think that aspect of interlinkages and, and showing that only in cooperation we can really also attract, uh, we can ensure this development in this tourism and cultural industry in Europe that if we work together. And uh, through interact programs, of course, cultural heritage and arts is, is the most popular theme. And we want to see that happening. We we also, I very much agree with our Italian colleague because we need to, when we talk about cities, we, we don't talk about purely city centers, okay? We have shifted away from this. We are talking about urban functional areas. We are talking about urban and rural linkages. And this is why we see also that in, in the field of cultural heritage and tourism, this cooperation becomes extremely important, particularly also in times of crisis when we see these huge drops in these industries industries in terms of, you know, um, income and everything. We need to think how we make it even more efficient in future and build this resilience. But this can only happen through cooperation. So our uh, next period in our programs features new policy objective, which is Europe closer to citizens, which is exactly about that. We want to support culture and tourism there um, as part of this functional cooperation between different territories. So that the aspect will be the key. Of course, now we also have a new um, deal between the co-legislators that where culture and tourism will feature specifically as a priority. We accepted that, particularly in this situation, the COVID situation. So I think, and just to mention lastly, so many, many opportunities in yeah. the future also, and also urban innovative actions. We hope that our new European Urban Initiative will keep supporting. We launched the call already in this on culture and cultural heritage, five projects ongoing, big demand from cities. So really, we, we hope to support it also for this innovative part, experimenting, finding solutions for different problems and, and building on advantages. So thank you for... Um, Listen yeah, thank me. you, Norvins. Uh, and indeed, um, uh, the urban agenda for the EU is also a great proof of how Europe can be brought closer to the citizens. Um, uh, that in itself, I think, is a big success. Uh, with that, uh, I'll close the, uh, the first round of uh, panel discussion uh, questions. And I'll give now over to my co-moderator, Jan Maat, for a second round of questions. So please, Jan Maat, yeah. uh, take over from me. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you all for this uh, very good insights. Uh, not all of us are so informed about culture and cultural heritage in the context of the urban agenda. So perhaps it's a good opportunity, if you allow, to get a few things a little bit more clear in detail. And 
uh, one thing that struck me, I'd like to go back to Berlin again, to Mr. Wu. Um, you know, we heard about your active involvement in the urban agenda uh, in various ways. But specifically here, in this partnership, you are focusing a lot on something which I find very intriguing, which is public libraries. Now, what is it for you that these public libraries can mean in all of these discussions? It's a very concrete question, but it would be very good to see what link you see in Berlin uh, and, and how you can enlighten us on that. Um, for, for the city of Berlin and for, for the Department of Culture and, uh, and Europe, um, it's, it's an um, important uh, possibility, opportunity to raise the awareness um, for public libraries. And um, in addition to that, other facilities of, of public services like uh, the decentralized, and, and I underline the, the word decentralized, it's, it's uh, not far, it's near to the citizens in, in a city, the decentralized uh, cultural institution, infrastructures and institutions uh, such as music schools, um, youth art uh, schools, and m municipal museums and galleries. Um, especially in Berlin, uh, uh, libraries, are the uh, cultural uh, institutions with, with the greatest reach uh, into the population and uh, no other uh, cultural in institution reaches so many and so diverse. That's it's important in a social sense, uh, diver diverse visitors and contributes uh, in this way uh, to the social and digital and uh, participation um, to um, a comparable extent um, as the public as, as the public libraries uh, do. Nevertheless, public libraries uh, at the European level are mostly uh, not taken uh, into account uh, in strategic uh, concepts. And uh, so uh, we, we want to highlight uh, their potential for, uh, for uh, the instant, for instance, to, to lifelong learning, uh, to education, training, and digital empowerment integration, and social cohesion. That's the, the important point for us. And we have this, this good experience uh, in this way. Um, at the final point, at the end of the day, a library is a, is a public space. Uh, it's, it's provided uh, from, from the public for the citizens of, of a city. And it's not only a, a place where you can get books and read, you have their space to, to have an, an access uh, to, to digital uh, formats of, of information and to uh, come together with, with, with other uh, citizens. It's a space for, for uh, uh, the, the life of the citizens of a city and, and very important in this sense. Okay, thank you very much. And I think it's so, so interesting also to listen to you and also thinking through the times we live in, where in many cases libraries, public libraries are temporarily closed. It's only now it seems that we see to the full the value of, uh, of libraries. But thank you so much. And also, it's very clearly understood that libraries are really important to bring culture to the citizens directly, right? Um, perhaps you can get a few more clarifications because we hear terms, we hear things all the time. Uh, Mr. Poppins, back to you. Uh, the Leipzig Charter uh, you refer to also, and it will indeed, you know, the new Leipzig Charter will be signed in a couple of days. There are links also with the urban agenda, right? And it also sets the scene a bit for the years ahead. Many people are interested to know also what, what can be expected from the urban agenda in going forward. Could you, from your perspective, say a few words about how you see the role of the urban agenda in that brand new Leipzig Charter? Th thank you, Jan Martin. Um... Well, the Leipzig Charter, I think, is the father of the EU urban agenda because it was there already before. And of course, it's good that it becomes renewed. Um, uh, we need to adjust. We are going through changes. And it's very good that we have already experience with the EU urban agenda. I'm very happy, by the way, that the partnership, which was one of the last two ones we established on culture and on security of public spaces, I was never sure where we will arrive with this, but I'm very happy to see that we do have action plans for both. Um, in fact, yesterday I was discussing the other one, security, because of the tragic events now in Europe. Again, we, we, we want to see with DG Home together what we can do more on helping cities to have solutions for their problems linked to security of public spaces and so on. But 
I'm happy that both of these partnerships have their action plans. And on culture and cultural heritage, there are important actions foreseen for everybody. We will be supporting them because we think we need to build on that concreteness that is in those actions and we need to pursue them. I mean, sometimes it's maybe not uh, as visible as Leipzig Charter, but this is what I think fills in the Leipzig Charter ideas and also the EU urban agenda with real substance. And this is what cities need. They need concrete deliverables and concrete improvements both in funding, also in sharing of a knowledge, uh, and also, of course, in better regulation. And we all accept, I think, that this uh, EU urban agenda, through this concrete work of partnerships, have shown that also in thematic fields, cities have an important role to play. And I think it builds also this awareness in all decision makers, I mean, at the EU level, national level, different levels of governance, that this always needs to be factored in. When we design something on culture, cultural heritage, horizontally, cities play a role. Together, of course, as functional uh, urban area with their surrounding territories. Again, I want to stress that. But we will keep supporting, obviously, whatever we can from the European Commission point of view. Uh, we hope that we can build on successes and eliminate, you know, certain duplications. We need to build better interlinkages between different partnerships. We need to see how we better prioritize because 14 is good. But when we talk about, you know, prioritizing our investment, prioritizing, you know, whatever we address first and everything, we need to come up with an understanding how we streamline this process, intergovernmental process together with the European Commission and involvement of citizen stakeholders is a relatively complex setup, but it works. And this is the first time where we see that this partnership between different levels of governance can actually deliver something concrete. And I'm very happy about it. And I'm very fond of it and we will keep promoting it also at the EU level, of course. And with cities, we will keep doing our outreach event, our cities forum, our networks will be running and we, we, we try to bring in what is delivered under the EU urban agenda. But it's a two-way process. It also requires, obviously, cooperation from national levels and pursuing also at national level very seriously those actions that we agree under these partnerships. Again, um, very happy to support whatever we can in future, but certain streamlining of the urban agenda, hopefully under the renewed Leipzig Charter, will also take place. Okay, thank you very much. And indeed, so good to hear from you also in person that these themes uh, are there to stay, right? The themes, we mentioned uh, also this, the sister partnerships and security, it's always more, uh, more topical than ever, but also in these times, culture and cultural heritage, not to speak of all the other 12 partnerships, always very relevant Absolutely. things. Think about digitization or the circular economy or, or, or the other partnerships. Thank you for that. Um, meanwhile, I think, Matt, I don't know whether you followed the chat, but it seems that with the public libraries, we struck a chord, right? Because we see all yeah. kinds of information about public libraries in Oslo and also in Helsinki. Uh, I, I, when I read the list of participants, I uh, really had very, very good memories of the fantastic library in Coimbra, also Coimbra region with this. And so there are so many beautiful libraries, which not have, only have a culture, but of course, also an educational purpose. So very good to bear that in mind and, and to make that a string also. I had a question yeah. still for Ms. Oriko. Yeah. I'm not sure that Oriko is still with us. Um, no, she, she left She left for a second, I think, uh, Jan Maarten. Uh, but talk, yeah, talking about libraries, to continue a bit about that, I also remember during the Finnish presidency just recently, uh, they showcased the library in uh, in Helsinki, which is, I think, an excellent example. I mean, quite, I mean, really, really impressive, where they offered a wide range of, uh, of activities to its uh, citizens, actually, going from all different kinds of workshops, working with different, different tools, very creative, very inspirational. And I think uh, that, indeed, there are very inspiring examples of uh, libraries uh, uh, contributing also to, uh, to let's say, the uh, strengthening the social fabric in cities. So uh, absolutely inspiring. Give us more examples in your chats if you want. Uh, we'll, we'll watch it closely. Uh, I think for now, Jan Marta, it's perhaps better to continue with another participant. We'll see yeah, uh, when yeah. this uh, Oniko is back. I actually wanted to uh, be very open and frank today because, you know, uh, this is the moment to actually pose the right questions. And it's a very privileged. And I have a question for Ms. Bola. I mean, we hear a lot uh, on this Leipzig Charter, we hear a lot about let's say, the importance of 
uh, the public space, and it is also very much emphasized. But what strikes me here in the Brussels bubble, something very strange happened as of late, because there is a new word that has entered the vocabulary here that many people do not know about. It's called Baukultur. And I think it is coming from sources very close to you. So could you please help a little bit understand what does Baukultur mean for you in this context of the Leipzig Charter and today's conference? Because that would be very good. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the question. And I hope Baukultur will be as much popular as kindergarten. So um, there, is, there is no English or French expression for uh, Baukultur. And thanks, first of all, Normans, for your kind, uh, um, uh, for your kind words to, to our presidency. But it won't work without, uh, without your support. So that this makes Europe. Uh, it's not the one who is organizing a conference. It's uh, um, dealing together, talking to each other, and talking about the subject and topics which are important for us. And so I now come back to Baukultur. So Baukultur is uh, so important for us. This, this is uh, one of the main topics uh, of the new Leipzig Charter. And we end it uh, already in the second chapter. So if you start reading, you come to Baukultur very, very soon. So because um, our idea is to give Baukultur a central role uh, exactly because it's so important for European cities. So uh, we got our history, and you see our history in our buildings, in our places, in the way things work together. In the, let's say it's a it's a way of uh, this is very special uh, just in Europe, and uh, we got Baukultur, uh, and in all its forms and faces. Just to name the natural, the built environment, various layers of time, it embodies the complexity and the diversity of the European city. And therefore, Baukultur is so important for the new Leipzig Charter. So, um, and especially, you, you mentioned the public spaces. Um, if public spaces are well designed, um, if all stakeholders are um, mm, with all stakeholders in mind, uh, people will identify with these places. They make them their own, and uh, they take care of them. And um, they feel safe, this is very important, and healthy in them. And uh, especially in the pandemic time, uh, we learned that uh, public spaces become very, very important, especially for people who have only, let's say, small houses, small uh, um, places where they can be on their own, but they want to meet, and they can meet in public with distance, of, of course. So um, our, our intention is um, that the Leipzig Charter uh, in both its previous and current versions stresses the importance of integrated urban development processes. And this becomes very, very important on the case of uh, public spaces. Um, integrated approaches acknowledge as, as it's a complex system. Cities constantly need to respond to changing reali realities. And uh, this is what we've learned uh, very, very hard in this uh, pandemic uh, situation. So um, cultural and cultural heritage have proven to be very, very adaptive. And uh, we had, they made cities resilient against all forms of crisis, and uh, not just the current pandemic. And I hope. Our intention in um, the, the, the Leipzig Charter to make Baukultur such a m very important point and topic of this will help us on that way. Thank you. That's very good because I thought in my naivety Baukultur was one stream, but you say it's a very diverse interpretation and it's really fit for purpose and uh, embracing the diversity of the cities. Thank you so much for that uh, clarification. Uh, very good. Uh, Matt, I think we got about five minutes left. Uh, why not? Pause in one question, a uh, very important question, the question, the question of the day almost, uh, to each of the three uh, uh, panelists uh, at the moment, uh, because I think Ms. Oriko is, is, is needs uh, an urgency, uh, so that's a pity, but uh, the question is about COVID and, the, and, and cities. And 
Uh, perhaps, Mr. Wupp, again, if you could very quickly, I know it's a huge passion, but uh, if you could um, perhaps share with us uh, what, what do you think that European cities, how can European cities remain attractive in these times, also in these times of the pandemic? Um, you mentioned the public libraries already, uh, once they're open, of course. Is there any other thing that comes to your mind, uh, perhaps in, in a one-minute uh, uh, response? Uh, how can European cities right now in this extremely difficult times still uh, be attractive and resilient? What's, what's your angle to that, uh, Mr. Wood? I think uh, the, the main thing is uh, to help uh, the, the, the artists and the uh, uh, cultural institutions uh, in, in the city uh, to come through uh, the, the crisis, the pandemic crisis. Uh, artists are mostly uh, freelancers and we have to, to give them support uh, in, in a financial way. Um, and uh, regarding the, the institutions, we, we have uh, we made some some concepts um, to help uh, the, the museums and the theaters uh, to to create a hygiene concepts, and uh, we helped them to uh, to get uh, the right uh, air condition uh, um, equi uh, equipment uh, because uh, fighting the the aerosols and and so so these things are, are very important. And of course, uh, you mentioned the, the libraries. Uh, we had to close that in in. Uh, in in spring, and we we had to we had uh, opened uh, the the libraries um, as quickly as uh, it was possible. So, and we will do the the same uh, at the end of the terrible days uh, in 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 December, I would say, because of the the high um, level of of um, uh, pandemic situation now in Berlin. But we will uh, overcome that, and and then we will open as uh, as quickly as is possible the, the libraries of course thank you thank you also for mentioning here specifically the situation of artists and as you say they are really amongst the, the hardest hit uh, in, in in the economy mr poppins you mentioned already the huge importance of the culture and cultural sector in the economy so what's your response to the question how can we keep cities attractive right now at this very moment at the end of 2020 what's your take on that I don't want to talk about COVID. I think we are working on a vaccine. It will happen and then we will forget about this, of course, until the next virus comes. But, <laughs> but um, I'm a, I studied virology, virology in the past. So, you know, cities will stay, uh, I mean, and, and our way of life will be like that. I think uh, we need to adjust. It's true. And I want to talk about the Bauhaus initiative because this is something which really I like a lot and I think um, Oh, I still have to convince the army of experts in the commission that this is good because they say, you know, initiatives come and go. We have different themes and we need to, to support integrated territorial development. This is true. We cannot split it in parts. We need to, like you say, I mean, cities have a multiple of challenges and potentials and we need to put it in one strategy and see how we prioritize, which is exactly what we propose under that new policy objective five, which is, you know, prioritizing on a place, you know, what you need you can invest under our our programs now we've we made that happen but Bauhaus to me initiative is about integrated approach it is exactly that it is the concept which actually is a life changer and if we will be able to put that initiative in front and and sort of build on that and, and mainstream it and I'm, I'm really I'm looking now how we could support that uh, we still need to work on a concept like you say not everybody understands it and we don't know we, we should avoid that it it stays as an elitism concept. It has to be, you know, owned and, and mainstream. But this is something we are thinking really also from our innovative actions to see how we can support cities who want to take this concept on and see how it can be implemented then in practice. And then, of course, we have a, a wide uh, mainstreaming and knowledge sharing possibilities on, on possibilities how to do it. I think that is an answer to cities' attractiveness. You know, if they are able to, to go ahead with concepts like that and show that they are not just, you know, cities 
activities, uh, with economic development and all the activities, but they are green, they are just, fair, and they include everyone, and, and they, they put this concept, uh, that then there is a big future for them. By the way, one word, I mean, I was just in Japan this morning, yesterday I was in China, tomorrow I will go to India, beauties <laughs> of virtual work. Uh, we are talking about international urban cooperation. We will launch next year a second phase of this IUC program, where we pair cities. It's very important to learn from our partners, you know. And I see that was, we had 165 cities supported through that program. So we will launch a second phase. So again, I would encourage all the cities actively look for these opportunities also at international level, because then we can also bring in, you know, different solutions to different problems and develop our potentials. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for that positive message, really. We are kind of, you know, always going from fear to hope. Very good to have your positive message. And it's also very good that you have been able to travel so much uh, without the jet lags and without so much uh, carbon emissions. So I think, you know, that's helped to also with the Green Deal and getting the Commission priorities in place. Last question, the same question also, and then I think we round off, Martin. It's good to see what you took out of this role. Also the question to, to, to Ms. Bola. So we heard, you know, on the one hand, we are in this crazy situation also in Berlin, uh, but then we hear the hope, uh, the virus, end of the tunnel. So how, how do we keep cities attractive also after this enormous shock, in your view? Uh, it would be very good to, in one minute uh, to hear, hear your final words when we close and indeed this, this first uh, round of discussion. Thank you. Okay, I tried in, 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 in one minute and it might be easier than you think. It's just uh, uh, let us look at what we have. And uh, it's, it's a very personal answer I would like to give, because uh, I'm forced to stay where I am, as, you, as all of you. And uh, I started walking through the quarters of Berlin. And um, what I learned, it's uh, I'm living in a cultural, very rich and diverse city. And uh, I learned to value this city more uh, than ever before. Yeah. So Fantastic. just stay. Walk around with distance, of course, and look what you have and enjoy it. And it's a fantastic, thank you so much, fantastic community to explore the nearby, right? Things that normally we don't see. And now actually we can open our eyes and see how much uh, great things and culture are around us. Thank you so much for those contributions. Um, Matt, I mean, um, uh, what, what have you taken out of the, the panel? Are there some buzzwords that spring to mind uh, before we move on to the next uh, part of the conference. Well, what I find fascinating is to see how culture and cultural heritage are actually the linking pin, uh, bringing together everything that is related to urban life. I mean, urban life is taking place uh, in a cultural context which is deeply connected to our European identity. Uh, and we see that in different aspects of urban policy or practices, indeed, culture and cultural heritage do play an important role. Um, and indeed, this linking pin is uh, embodied also within this concept of Baukultur. And I think we should use the word in German, indeed, I agree. It's, uh, it's a wonderful word. It is impossible to translate, but I think the more we use it, the more obvious it becomes also to, uh, to express, uh, let's say, how we actually appreciate uh, this particular aspect of uh, urban development. Okay, fantastic. And I think indeed it shows already going back to the vision that this partnership has, how important culture and cultural heritage is in uh, making the cities uh, sustainable, even in this, uh, or protect, even in these crazy times. And I think that's a very encouraging message indeed. So I think on those words, uh, a very big thank you to the panelists um, uh, for, your, for, your, for your insights. Uh, and I hope you can still uh, stay with us a bit because we are going to move to the next session, uh, Mark, right? We're going to actually talk a bit about the Urban Agenda Partnership itself and uh, do that in the context of the new Leipzig Charter. And we have in Studio 5 uh, one of uh, the key engines of our uh, partnership. It's uh, Jan Schultheis, and you're uh, also accompanied by the Italian brothers and sisters uh, from uh, the National Agency of the Territorial Region. It's Sandra and Giovanni. 
when I well known to uh, to hello together sitting together. Yes, I do. I didn't recognize you, but now I see uh, who are those two people. Yeah. It's, okay. it's fantastic. Uh, you know. Okay, smashing. Okay, uh, I think Jan, are you ready to to shed some light on uh, the um, the urban agenda, uh, culture partnership in the context of the Leipzig Charter? Try to make the connection with uh, Berlin uh, with Studio Five. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? We do hear you yeah. with a slight echo, but let's see if that works. I think we also have a presentation, uh, Marta. Yes. I am expecting a presentation. Yes. Yes. So exactly. Over. Yeah. 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 Meanwhile, is there something in the chat that we have forgotten? Uh, I didn't look for that for this little second. Uh, what did you have a chance to look at the second chat? Let me see. Well, I see remarks also about the importance of public spaces, um, also in relation to Balkotor. That's really interesting. Uh, and um, let me see. Well, actually, there is a uh, one of the uh, participants, Matrai Hoffman, uh, is also saying that there is a European network that works on the topic of churches and places of worship to give them new uses. Yes. And we will be talking yes. about that, by the way, in one of the workshops. Uh, but I see Jan is now ready, so uh, let's continue with him. Over to you, Jan. Jan, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, this is this is Jan Giovanni. I'm, I, I actually thought you would be starting the presentation. Okay. Well, that's inherent in virtual uh, in virtual conferences. Indeed, it's a bit difficult sometimes to communicate between Berlin and Rome. Uh, who will start the presentation? Actually, is it Berlin or Rome? It's it is Rome. Rome. Okay, please. I'm doing Go the on. second please. portion of the presentation. Please. Okay. okay, we can do we can do some voting too, right? But I don't think it's needed. So uh, we start with Rome. Very good. Wonderful. We cannot hear Rome. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Giovanni Pieski from the Agency for Territorial Cohesion. Uh, with me is Sandra Gislis, this coordinator for the Italy, uh, this uh, urban agenda. And I started to describing uh, the the contents of the this partnership, and then uh, Jan will uh, continue to explain. So, um, first, uh, you can uh, go forward with the slides. I ask you, okay. So, this uh, presentation deals with uh, a brief description of the partnership, who we are and how we work. Then we try to describe briefly the action plan. And then uh, we, we describe uh, what uh, in, the f in the future we will implement. And then you can ask if you have some doubts or remarks. We are here to answer. Next, please. As you know, the urban agenda is, um, is composed by partnership. Initially, 12 partnerships were established, and then two further partnerships were approved. The one is a security in public spaces, the second one is a culture and culture aid. These two last partnerships were developed in a parallel, and uh, both of these uh, partnerships presented the action plan, what is the main outcome of this partnership. Okay, next please. Okay, what uh, actually is a partnership? A partnership is a consortium among uh, uh, different institutions, and the particularity is that these consortiums are multi-level functioning. So we have uh, EU Commission representative, member states, regions, metropolitan cities, uh, small medium-sized cities, and so on. The partnership uh, develops uh, uh, around a three-year process of uh, um, 
design of the, the, the action plan and, and the implementation of the actions uh, carried out in this action plan. So the main outcome, so the goal is to develop together with a transnational process of, uh, of designing a, a, an action plan. And then once this action plan is developed, uh, the partnership goes to the implementation phase of the single actions. The uh, action plan is aimed basically to reach three uh, types of goals. Is uh, characterized by the urban agenda, better regulation, or not new rules, but a better way to use the rules, the regulation of EU uh, uh, programs and initiatives. A better funding uh, through uh, confrontation amongst the partners. Uh, we try to develop new way to funding to better use the, the EU resources uh, to develop urban policies. And then a better exchange uh, aimed to, uh, in, to intensify the exchange of experience, knowledge and uh, capability to develop urban policy together with the common uh, challenges that are uh, targeted in the in the different uh, partnership. This is the the profound sense of the uh, urban agenda and partnerships. Next, please. Okay. What's uh, okay? Uh, the, 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 the Amsterdam Pact started before the, the left each other, the new left each other. But what is the relationship uh, among the, the, the urban agenda and the left each other? And basically, the the urban the left each other is a, is a, a broad and lasting framework, long term a framework with the basic principles to develop urban policies and a perspective of what uh, the European cities will be in the future. So a long-term perspective. In this, uh, in this framework, the urban agenda acts as a tool for implementing and experimenting uh, urban policy through thematic partnerships. So, uh, the urban agenda acts uh, like uh, implementing the tools of the general principle of uh, life to each other. This is very important because uh, because uh, uh, the, the principle of life to each other are are are, are based on uh, long term. Uh, uh, concept like, for instance, uh, the social innovation, no more, uh, no more uh, in terms like inclusion, but uh, just, just is a new term that uh, uh, means uh, uh, more equilibrated uh, urban policies uh, aimed to uh, justice, not not more inclusion. And and uh, the, and uh, furthermore, green, green. Uh, green development. So this is the, the basic framework of uh, the life the charter and the relationship among... Uh, okay, next please. Okay, you see in this uh, graph the relationship among uh, new life the charter, the strategic framework, and then urban agenda that uh, acts like uh, an uh, uh, implementation, in, in collective implementation to a multi-level and so on. Okay, we can go further. Okay, what is the, uh, let, let's talk about uh, the partnership of culture and culture heritage. Uh, the goals uh, are to uh, aim to uh, develop a sense of culture and heritage as a driver for uh, the urban development. Uh, by uh, raising aware awareness uh, for the need for careful and stock oriented development of the European city at the local, national, and European level, by using culture as a driver for the uh, social but also economic development, promotion of the architectural and cultural heritage as a starting point for integrated urban development strategy and planning. So the culture and the heritage is the put at the center of some uh, development uh, urban policies. This is very 
the very uh, founding point of uh, this heritage. And then, if uh, to hamper and uh, promote uh, the different layers and different characters uh, that makes the European cities uh, um, very particular situation in the in the in the panorama of uh, world cities. Uh, European cities have all European cities have an heritage as an identity factor, main identity factor of uh, their development. And then uh, in the identification of measure to create a common understanding and framework for promoting cultural heritage and sustainable urban development processes. This is very important because the me different measures are all converging to, to compose an integrated strategy to uh, urban development and urban assets based on the cultural heritage. And then technical, political and financial support of municipalities for the careful handling of different time layers through uh, um, for instance, through by using the European Fund structural funds uh, to achieve uh, these uh, goals and uh, better have a better asset of urban uh, European uh, cities. Okay, next, please. Okay, we have a very, very, very private uh, partnership of uh, all, uh, um, nearly 30, 30 partners that. Uh, um, participated to this uh, partnership, uh, coming from uh, central institutions, uh, local uh, central governments, uh, research institutions, uh, and uh, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, metropolitan cities, uh, small and medium uh, sized city, and so on. This uh, very uh, uh, composed partnership. Uh, can bring uh, some uh, uh, richness to this partnership by adding that different perspective, different point of view. And uh, now we are very satisfied that you have an action plan that uh, reflects these different approaches, this different point of view uh, by commission, uh, cities, uh, uh, local uh, uh, regions and uh, research institution and so on. So the richness is reflected by the approach. Next, please. So uh, this approach uh, lasted uh, a lot of time and a lot of work because uh, we had, uh, we, we take time to make converge this different point of view and different approaches in a single document that reflected all this uh, feature. So we started it in 2019 uh, with the, uh, the first meeting of uh, uh, converging uh, to put together the ideas. And then we, through the working group, we uh, set up some strategies and actions and now in, uh, today, we have the action plan that reflects uh, this uh, job of convergence that Jan, uh, afterward, will will explain better. Okay, let's go, let's go um, forward. Okay, the approach. So the result of this approach is to have uh, a model uh, that feeds the action plan of um, urban policies based on the culture and cultural heritage based on five main pillars that correspond to five main strategies to develop an integrated uh, urban strategies for the, the European cities, based on the cultural tourism, the creative and cultural sectors, both uh, industries but also informal sector that uh, feed the, the cultural uh, um, framework in the European cities. Uh, the way to transform uh, and to adapt and reuse the, and uh, reconvert the, the physical and the heritage on the monuments but also uh, built architecture and so on. And uh, the the theme of resilience of cultural and natural heritage uh, against the risk of uh, climate change, of earthquake, or the human pressures that uh, uh, incurred in the 
in the series of uh, work series. And uh, last, the, the role of cultural service within this series. And as uh, you said uh, before in the debate, how the libraries, but also uh, the, the in general, the services, the human services can contribute to develop the cultural framework among the people in, in within uh, European cities. These five uh, main strategies are sustained by the, the basement that uh, are two main uh, transversal topics represented by the financial sustainability and funding of the heritage and uh, uh, all the in general the initiative linked to the culture and uh, uh, heritage enhancement and uh, a tool of integrated and interdisciplinary approaches for governance so we know that uh, to achieve uh, results uh, in uh, social innovation uh, in uh, improving the identity and the culture of uh, cities, we need to adopt an, uh, an uh, integrated approach that uh, use uh, in the same time different tools, uh, urban development tools, uh, intangible tool, tools uh, like services, for instance, landscape, but also the participation of uh, civil society and, uh, and as well the participation of uh, uh, economic uh, actors and the stakeholders. This is very important, the integrated approach for the uh, urban policies. Without this integrated approach, the results are not uh, so, so um, impressive, are not so um, efficacy and uh, this is important it's a, it's a key point for our uh, action plan so uh, again yes, next please um, yes. good morning from berlin thank you giovanni i'll be glad to take over um, and I would like to briefly explain to you how we move towards the actions. Um, and please keep in mind those five columns of the temple that Giovanni just presented. We took a very close look at these five topics and looked at gaps, opportunities, areas that we felt are important to really come to recommendations because that's our ultimate goal to develop valuable recommendations. So you can see we had a lot of ideas, those are the colored icons on the left, and we had to find a way to narrow them down because it's clear we can only at the end of the day implement a very limited amount of actions. So we used some criteria to um, bring these various actions together, to cluster them, to combine them, to prioritize them. For instance, we looked at how feasible is it to implement the actions within the year that we actually have. You might think a year is a lot, but actually it's not a lot of time, given that the actions are very ambitious. We looked at resources, which resources are available, how relevant are the actions to all of our members? Because as Giovanni just said, we have a very big membership, very diverse, small cities, big cities in the East and the West. And so they should be relevant to everybody. It should be innovative and new because that's really the spirit of the urban agenda to be on a new path. Um, it should also integrate with other policies to be more effective. And of course, it should have a person leading the action, very important. So at the end of the day, we ended up with 11 actions and we have a suitcase full of ideas that we had to drop for the moment because we couldn't implement it, but we really have a lot of ideas to move forward. And here you see the 11 actions that we finalized. I won't go into detail because my uh, colleagues, the other action leaders will explain them in more detail. 
but I'll uh, just explain some general remarks about them. Now is really an important moment for us because we are about to start the implementation phase and we want to discuss with you, for instance, what should, be a we, what should we be aware of during implementation? Are there some stumbling stones that we should avoid? Uh, are there some partners we should still involve? So we very much look forward to the exchange with you later on. Now this is our octopus, as we call it, our octopus graphic. Um, it's meant to show that the actions are not in isolation. They are just not just a list of isolated actions, but they are interlinked, making them even more meaningful and effective. And by the way, we are also hoping to link our actions with the other partnerships in the urban agenda to have an even greater impact. This is our Pentagon, another way to look at the actions. Uh, here, the actions are grouped in five connected and integrated urban strategies based on culture and cultural heritage as main drivers for development. And these five strategies are resilience, strengthening and protecting heritage against natural and man-made threats, cultural services, enlarging the role of urban services to strengthen cultural identity of citizens, cultural tourism, balancing touristic flows for a sustainable management of heritage, number four, culture and creative sectors, fostering inclusion and the local economy through cultural initiatives, and finally, transformation, adaptive reuse, and urban reconversion, which refers to the revitalization and reuse of urban heritage through collaborative processes. What's important on this slide? Number one, you see the th three circles. They indicate what Giovanni mentioned, the Pact of Amsterdam, better funding, better knowledge, better regulation. We are really trying to have an impact in all three areas, which is also something that assessment study of the urban agenda really pointed out. And then these five strategies are important because we'll f discuss the, in these categories, we'll have our workshops later on. We'll have four workshops based on these four categories. So please keep that, our Pentagon in the backs of your mind. We went through a very comprehensive consultation process and uh, really took a lot of feedback that we could incorporate in our action plan. We consulted the public using the website Futurium. Um, we had more than 100 answers and that's really an important task for us to make sure we reach the public and we have visibility. So that's an ongoing task for us. We had the inter-service consultation with the various departments of the European Commission. They gave us a lot of feedback, 55 pages actually, um, and for instance told us that you really need to reduce and focus. Then we consulted the member states of the European Commissions in September and October. We got a lot of positive feedback. And in the end, it was approved, our action plan was approved on October 21st. And today we are really hoping to engage with you some more and continue the dialogue. Now, we added a new chapter to the usual structure of the action plan with some strategic and political statements that we feel are very important. For us, they're sort of the common thread through our work. And we feel that this could also be a long-term vision for future political agreements. And we will actually use them also as a base for the conclusions on the action plans, which we'll discuss with you tomorrow. So let me please share them with you. Number one, fostering a broader understanding of culture and cultural heritage in European cities. What does that mean? We want to really look at, for instance, both the tangible and the intangible dimensions. We want to look at various historical periods, both medieval and more recent, both the comfortable heritage, but also the uncomfortable, the dissonant heritage. We want to not just include protected heritage, but also, for instance, landscapes and urban places. And here in the image you see the Busluja Memorial in Kazanlak, Bulgaria, which is one of our members. 
You want to protect value and democracy through culture and cultural heritage. We feel that our joint European history builds the foundation for our democratic values and is manifested in our heritage, for instance, in public spaces as places of meeting, participation and freedom of expression. We want to promote the capacity of culture and cultural heritage to increase resilience in European cities. Resilience against threats, for instance, right now, very much against the COVID-19 pandemic, but also man-made threat and natural disasters such as climate change. Because culture and cultural heritage have proven to be very responsive and adaptive as a system and to recover from these threats. We want to promote integrated approaches and practice and funding. What does that mean? We don't just promote cooperation between planning departments and stakeholders, but also we want to take culture and cultural heritage as a starting point for future urban development strategies and funding mechanism. And lastly, from social inclusion to territorial cohesion, the heritage, both built and natural, are driving factors for social cohesion and sustainable territorial urban development, meaning we want to connect place-based and people-based approaches, looking at what is really specific about places in collaborative processes, looking at the local know-how, the local identity of places and people, and making sure everybody has access to this. This also touches on the notion of the common good in the new Leipzig Charter. Finally, I just want to highlight what's ahead of us. All of the discussions we'll be leading in this conference will, of course, be integrated in our work. So please consider making your contributions later in the workshops. You'll find the email addresses of our action leaders in the uh, brochure. And um, we really are looking for a dialogue with you in the time to come. We'll implement the actions, of course, until the end of next year. We'll have meetings, hopefully also physical and we'll be monitoring our work, making sure we are on track and we are actually meeting our goals. That's our overview for here and uh, we look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Jan, Giovanni and Sandra for this momentous presentation. I think one thing is clear, you've done an incredible amount of work. I actually printed out the action plan uh, in two parts. It has 103 <laughs> pages and actually it's very very dense and very interesting reading it's almost like your bible talking about religious uh, terms you mentioned quite a few in them uh, already both we talk about temples we saw a very interesting temple we can see clearly the influence of the greek partner there but also uh, you mentioned the pentagon and uh, there was in the chat interesting questions on actually how you deal in the partnership with religious buildings. So perhaps a question first to our Italian friends, because I don't know any other cities in, in the world almost where you have so many uh, religious buildings and many of them churches, of course. Now, they're not necessarily abandoned, but some of them may be. So uh, when we see in the chat, there is also a, future, a, a network on the future of religious places. So uh, can you say something, uh, Giovanni and Sandra, on to what extent uh, you build in religious buildings and also think ahead about the future role of, of those buildings because they are so at the heart of, uh, of all our cities, but particularly so the Italian cities. So, okay, uh, actually the, the role of... Uh, oh, pardon, pardon, pardon. Yeah, you're two, on two uh, different... Uh, um, Channels now, Giovanni. Yeah. yeah, you need a good one, indeed. Okay, can you hear now? Yes, it's very good. Okay. okay. Actually, the role of uh, the heritage, the re religious heritage in urban uh, framework is very important because, because uh, it's related uh, to a tradition, to a tradition, a social tradition. In other words, uh, church, uh, um, uh, cult uh, uh, buildings uh, are uh, strictly related with uh, the population that lives uh, uh, in, in the cities. So that is a is a very strong. There was a story historically 
a very strong relationship uh, um, between uh, a place, uh, a cultural place, uh, a culture of people. This relationship in the in the modern uh, era, in the modern times, uh, tends to uh, vanish. So it is important that you build the new values uh, among uh, heritage, not only the church. Uh, and the religious heritage, but also the new representative uh, buildings of uh, the um, local identities. This is, this is the, the real challenges. So we have to rebuild, to spend money to maintain uh, this, uh, this, uh, this heritage, but not as a, a museum or just a monument, like a living um, um, uh, of uh, of uh, the people that live there. This is uh, the important thing. That's why we, we talk about uh, social inclusion, uh, participation, uh, and uh, no one left behind, because, because this is the very important sense of the culture and the heritage. And the heritage represents uh, always, uh, always uh, uh, the local people living, local identities. This is the, the, the relationship we have to keep uh, uh, solid, keep alive. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that uh, insight. Mart, uh, before we go to a uh, coffee break, uh, any thoughts from you uh, after these fantastic presentations? Looking at the chat as well. Yeah, well, looking at the chat, I have just perhaps one question which covers also a bit of the, which puts the idea of cultural and cultural heritage in a modern perspective. Uh, and it does also relate to the issue, uh, again, of, uh, of Baukultur. Um, and it's a question from Tom, Hayam in uh, from Kalsru, who says, "Well, we need to, we need to build uh, buildings for the increased urban population, actually. And how, um, uh, to what extent, is culture and cultural heritage a hindrance for for this form of urban development? Uh, when you need to build, indeed, more houses for the increased." Uh, urban population. I think this is a question for for many participants, but I think perhaps also uh, even more so for uh, our guests from Italy. So, Sandra, perhaps you could resp you could take that question. You need to unmute, please. Actually, this housing uh, sector, the housing policy, is a, is a really important question, is a key point here. And um, the, the matter is uh, not to expand the cities so much, so not to use a greenfield. And um, so the, the, the challenge here is to work with owners, big and small owners of housing, and to uh, reuse these uh, private housing for other purposes, housing or social housing, for example, or to use a, a farmer, how do you say, a, a farmer, big buildings, uh, public buildings, uh, change the, for social housing again. So to reuse uh, the heritage we have within uh, the settlement uh, already built and, and, and not to expand the city so much. So it's a, it's a challenge of networking uh, and, uh, and also of partnership within the public and the private in order not to have an urban sprawl, but to reuse and, uh, and also to tackle the gentrification as well. But it's a, it's a good uh, question. It's okay. I can try to yeah. something. So the important thing, so in, in Italy, like in Europe, we have some uh, cities uh, shrinking and some uh, cities uh, uh, expanding. Uh, in any case, uh, we have to avoid the fact that the urban uh, um, enlargement is uh, cut off of the process of, the process of uh, identification of uh, identity and the cultural uh, uh, um, uh, being of the, uh, the population. This is the this is the, the mistake we have uh, to avoid. In the in the last uh, years. Uh, cities expanded without uh, uh, carrying off the culture uh, representativeness of the citizen. Just uh, houses, housing, housing, housing. This is the problem. So we have the problem of uh, urban peripheries. The important thing is to regain the correct relationship between buildings, neighbors, uh, districts, also new districts, 
and a sense of belonging of citizens. It's something that we lost in the last years, and it is something that we have to regain again. Okay, I'd like to encourage, yeah, thank you very much for your answer. I'd like to encourage also the participants to ask more questions in the chat, but we are also uh, entitled to have a short coffee break now, I think. Uh, yes. So what I propose is you continue filling, quest, filling the chat with more questions. You will participate uh, in the afternoon also in workshops where there is a lot of room also for interactivity. But now I think we all are entitled to have a short break. Uh, we'll come back in in five minutes' time. I see that some of the panelists for our next international panel are already there. Thank you very much. And then uh, please stay connected. You can switch off your video uh, and we'll resume in five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you in five minutes. Fantastic.
Yeah, first, good because we got yeah, a very really interesting session now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and looking forward to that. So very good. Okay. Welcome back, and thank you for being disciplined and diligent. Um, we uh, are going to speak now about, as we announced already uh, at the beginning, about the uh, role of European culture and cultural heritage in an international context. As I mentioned before, uh, some of us, including myself, are in this Brussels bubble, Eurocentric, and we sometimes keep forgetting that the world is a little bit bigger. So it's an absolute <laughs> pleasure that we have uh, three people with us, three distinguished panelists, who actually have that global perspective. And I don't know whether you have done the same as I've done. I looked in the wonderful booklet and I looked also at the profiles of our wonderful speakers. And let me first, uh, uh, we have three uh, uh, distinguished speakers with us. Let me uh, very quickly announce them uh, all three. We have this is, uh, ladies first, Louise Huxthausen. Louise, hello. Uh, good to have you with us. Uh, may I call you a UNESCO tiger, uh, as you have been already for a very long time, uh, more than 25 years at UNESCO. And it's so interesting to see that uh, whilst you're based in the headquarters now, you also did missions in Afghanistan and Palestine. You worked in the Middle East, in the Arab world. And uh, gosh, I think this, then I think I, I want to really love to join the UN the system too, because it's really uh, the, the global world. And that perspective, good to have that to the table. We have also with us, if all is right, yes, Professor Dr. Jörg Haspel. Dr. Jörg Haspel, welcome also. You are the current president of ECOMOS. And I had to look up what ECOMOS was because I didn't know it. But it is indeed the International Council on, um, uh, now my own handwriting, on the on monuments and sites, right? So spot on here uh, also on this topic. And so interesting to find out your, your background is both in architecture and in history. And you have been uh, doing many, many, many things. But what sticks out is your role as state curator of the Senate Department for Urban Development for a very, very long time. But also your uh, role as chairman of the Deutsche Stiftung Denkmalschutz, another German word which is impossible to translate so beautiful it is. It's very, very good to have you with us. And uh, last but not least, I would also like to give a warm welcome to another, if I may say, UN hero or UN tiger, is Paulus uh, Kulikauskas, who is the chief of the UN Habitat Office here in Brussels. And also Paulus has done a lot of things. He's been with Urbach, so he knows cities very well. but did a lot of things for UNESCO, the World Bank, EBRD, USAID, and has also been around. Gosh, I mean, Paulus, yes. I didn't know you were in the Balkans, Sri Lanka, South Africa, Sudan, Brazil, and of course, most of the EU countries. So, I mean, that is a perspective very good to have. So, a warm, warm, warm welcome to all three of you. And, uh, you know, we, we try to keep it engaging and interesting, and you have all three such a fantastic background. Uh, I'm sure you can improvise and answer yes, any questions. Sento. Any questions uh, okay. that you have. And we have a few questions, actually not too few. We have uh, three uh, really questions, and then, of course, uh, towards the end, uh, at, uh, at in, in good half an hour, we have also time to get back to uh, your questions from the chat. So feel free, whilst you listen, uh, to put questions in the chat so that we can wrap up nicely, have a good German lunch of one hour at 12 o'clock. So we are with you here for the next 50 minutes. Um, ladies first, I would say, uh, uh, Louise, um, we talked already about culture and culture heritage and how it can contribute to the resilience of urban areas, but also social inclusion. Very, very, very big question. But uh, when we resonate, when we talk about that question here from an international perspective, what you're thinking about that? Uh, what is your thoughts? And you're muted still, so it's good to have you unmuted. <laughs> Check. Yes, uh, there must be a mute button, which is still on. Bottom of your screen, probably. This is so. Yeah, that's the pleasures of Zoom. Yes, it's actually very 
we all know by Christmas what we will say, you know, please unmute, that's the phrase of the year. <laughs> if it is uh, if it is at the moment not possible to speak, perhaps uh, there is a text call to speak, perhaps uh, there is a technician close by you. Um, uh, can I pose the same question to you then? First, wow. uh, Professor Haspel, I'll repeat the question. How can culture and cultural heritage contribute? We'll come back to you, to Louise, in a minute. I'm sure uh, we can uh, address that, also the technicians on our end. But if you can pose the question to uh, Professor Haspel also, how can cities contribute to the increase of resilience and social inclusion in urban areas? What's your take on that, uh, Professor Haspel? Uh, I, th I think that... Um cultural heritage is a kind of, of a renewable resource and uh, of an energy which can be which is made by 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 human beings so it is able to be reactivated always uh, in the history and it has survived uh, the history of uh, culture and is and it always was stimulating and encouraging uh, the, the situation so especially in crisis times and in challenges faces that is why i think cultural heritage it's not only part of the past but it also can play a, a key role uh, for the future and that is why we think that uh, cultural heritage should be given a, a central p position in the discussion on the Neues Bauhaus, on the new Bauhaus and also on the European Green Deal. It was Europa Nostra and it was ECOMOS who said it in the last days that we should put cultural heritage in the center of the European Green Deal and we need a European heritage green papers. And the Italian State Secretary at the beginning, she mentioned that we need a kind of paradigm shift and I think it's worth to think about this paradigm shift. And the second aspect is that heritage is very complex and very uh, diverse and so it requires respect and it also requires an integrative approach or an approach of community uh, involvement so that it is able to discuss not only the so-called own culture but also the foreign alt, uh, culture or the culture of the others and to find an integrated approach that is why i think it's a school of, of tolerance and of multiculturalism which can be uh, discussed when we discuss cultural heritage and it is uh, also a very important instrument and subject of education for a democratic community in the cities Thank you so much. I, I, I wrote that down, culture as a renewable energy. That's a wonderful integrated term, and I think that's one to capture. Um, uh, Paulus, on that same question, um, any thoughts on how culture and cultural heritage can contribute to the increase of the resilience of urban areas and promote social Big uh, question. Well, uh, can, can you hear me? Very good. Very well. Yeah. Loud and clear. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> I would want also to start a little bit uh, Sort of before I get to the question, you know, when the Pact of Amsterdam was born and uh, we looked at, you know, this overarching goal of improving regulation and funding and knowledge or information, I was a bit scared that this uh, whole uh, urban agenda for the EU is going to go excessive pragmatism and uh, some kinds of instrumentalism, now, which is represented also by your question, Jan <laughs> uh, Yeah, Of course, pragmatism and instrumentalism are needed, but uh, they can become an enemy of uh, achieving the goals if uh, they are completely devoid of the deeper understanding of the subject. Mm, and uh, there we can see that, you know, sometimes people limit culture, you know, to artistic expressions. You know, and uh, I, I really wanted to, to, to look at uh, the, the, the whole problem or the whole issue as this partnership has looked, where culture is closer to, to what has been def defined by Spengler. And uh, also, I have a little bit of uncomfortable uh, feeling with cultural heritage, because if you would recall David Leuventer and different uh, ways that we engage with the past, 
When Arag heritage is something that we designate as important, what about the whole entirety of the relics of the past? It is an underlying dimension of uh, identity. And there are some dimensions and elements which are not embraced by this definition and subsequent classification. So when I looked at the results of what this partnership has produced, I was so positively impressed by the broad uh, understanding uh, of, of culture and cultural heritage that is underlying to the whole work of this partnership. Uh, now, it also for me, as, as someone from UN Habitat, it is very important that uh, this broad understanding of culture and cultural heritage has been building on the notions of the new urban agenda, you know, that the culture-led and culture-based. So when when we come to, to, to your question, saying that if we if we take this dimension of culture, which includes its temporal dimension through cultural heritage, which integrates the tangible and the intangible, and which must be considered if we speak about the pragmatic dimension of it, in the strategic and spatial or territorial planning approaches as universal and not an isolated concern. Or moreover, it is important not to see it as a commodity or a chapter or some selected territories or objects. But much as we have learned to see the environmental objectives of our work, I think that is the most important approach that would also help to come to um, increasing, uh, among other things, the resilience of, of uh, development and uh, uh, of uh, um, including the... the, the, the We lost you. But I think we lost uh, yeah. the Paulo. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, I see that uh, Palios is continuing to talk, but we don't hear you. Palios, I hope you can reconnect. We missed a few questions, a few uh, sentences you just uh, spoke. Unfortunately, because it's highly interesting. After you mentioned the word resilience, the connection broke down. That is quite symbolic, isn't it? Yes. But uh, indeed, I think, uh, yes, I mean, this is inherent uh, of these days. Yeah. The technology is not always on our side. Perhaps, Paulus, we will come back to you because we are very keen to, to, to pick up uh, on your thread. Uh, but what we heard already um, is there the, the, the need to go deep, right? And also, I think, uh, not to scratch the surface and that really culture is, is something not to, uh, to, to forget, even if it's not always very tangible. Luis, can we try uh, your connection at this moment? Are you back with us? Uh, Luis, can we, can we hear you? Still seems not... Uh, Luis is not muted, hopefully. No. No, but still no sound. Okay, a few, you seconds, a few more seconds, okay. Yeah, and then I think to improvise a bit, uh, Jan Maarten, there's no virtual conference without some technical yeah. hitch up, of course. Just just a little joke on that, Maarten. I, I, a few few months ago, which was in the early days, I was a backup yeah. moderator for a conference. And we, and all of a sudden, we lost the chair, we lost <laughs> three speakers, and we lost the technical host. So uh, we managed also that. So I'm sure... So what did you, what did you do? <laughs> well, I think, you know, I just started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is modern times, and despite yeah. all the efforts put in, this is happening, and I think it's 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 okay. We'll always manage at the end, you know. So it's good. To, uh, it definitely, yeah, yeah. But we do have one speaker which is connected here with with audio and with video. So if you want, uh, if you want to take over and pose another question to our distinguished professor in the studio. Which actually proves it may be best to be in the studio because you have a preferred. Yes, connection. you know we wanted to come to to travel to Berlin, but uh, indeed with quarantine it was too difficult and too complex. Uh, let's do a quick check with Paulius and Luis if there is any sound. Uh, Paulius, do you hear us? 
He does hear us, but there's no sound. Um, no, no, we don't hear you. Uh, okay, then I would say let, let's move to the uh, second question that uh, that we prepared. It is for uh, uh, Professor Haspel. Um, well, you you've been so much involved in in working in the field of cultural cultural heritage with um, uh, your your involvement in 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 let's say working on the importance of monuments and um, uh, other aspects of cultural heritage. Um, if we if I were to ask you, I mean, how we could promote and protect our culture and cultural heritage, what would be your top priorities, actually, if you were to uh, to be asked to to give, let's say, your top three actions that you would like to see realized, and also perhaps within the current framework of uh, that we are in now, uh, but not exclusively, I would say. So please uh, give us share some of your thoughts, and that would allow the others perhaps to prepare and to join in a bit later. So please, Mr. Uh, Professor Hasbro. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it is the, the most important or the most urgent and uh, most effecti effective uh, development uh, which should be driven, but I would like to discuss a very productive contribution for the development both of urban communities as well as urban democracy. That is the so-called Faro Convention on the value of cultural heritage for society, which was adopted by the European uh, Council in 2005 and which has been ratified since then by 19 member states um, and uh, by, by six states it was signed, so only a half of 47 members uh, have accepted and have ratified it now. And this Faro Convention is important because it defines heritage as a cultural good and it emphasizes the human right approach to cultural heritage and that it is a democratic value which should be shared uh, by, by the communities, by all social groups um, and by the residents in the cities and in, it encourages us to recognize objects and places as important because of the value which is added to them by the people, by the, uh, by the use of, of the people which is attached by them. And it promotes cultural diversity and inclusion as a fundamental cultural participation and self-determination. So it's, there is a right to culture and a right to cultural heritage. And culture is not something additional um, except of, um, of economy, of social development and so on. And I mention this Faro Convention because until today only half of the member states have ratified this Faro Convention and maybe it is a special task and challenge and opportunity for cities in Europe to be invited and to be encouraged to form somewhat like an urban alliance to promote this, the recognition and the enforcement of the Faro Convention. And if the member states if the governments, if the parliaments have not yet been able to sign it and to come to the convention, then perhaps there is a responsibility of the European cities and of an obligation of the cities where the mass majority of people in Europe are living to think about an, the, the adoption and the implementation of the, this convention by the municipalities itself. So don't wait for the governments, but take your own responsibility. And I think the European presidency of the Federal Republic is a very good opportunity to think yes. about the federal convention, even though it is, has not been yet signed by the Federal Republic itself. Aha, uh -huh. oh, that's interesting. I was, I was just about to ask you, I mean, why only, uh, in that sense, 50% of the, of, the, uh, of the member states have signed the convention? And, and why then, and to make it even more specific, why did Germany uh, not sign it for the moment? What were the political hiccups? Um, I'm not well uh, informed about why they are hesitating and what are the, the, the obstacles to, to sign this Faro Convention when you see that half of the member states have signed it. But I can imagine that the, the question that there is a, a human right of cultural heritage which is owned by the people, by the residents, and which can be required by them, that that is the problem because it is a 
totally different approach to cultural heritage than we are used to it during the last 100 or 200 years of cultural heritage preservation. And that is the reason why we are thinking about how can we allow it, how will we react, how can we allow that communities are involved in decision making on cultural heritage. And that may be that is the reason. So we have to think about how can we organize Culture, not only the conservation of cultural heritage or of monuments and sites, but how can we organize as a society or as a, uh, as a municipality and as a, an urban community the process of adopting and of appropriation uh, of cultural heritage. That is, I think, the reason. And so it is a challenge for the society and it is also a challenge, of course, for the politicians and as well for the administration. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Perhaps I just, I just we, yeah, we can do about it. Is it I your voice? You. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Excellent. I'm <laughs> okay, sorry. wonderful. You managed. Yeah. <laughs> well, I also noticed you have been working a lot on the topics. I mean, I don't know if you have been able to follow the uh, the questions uh, so far. Uh, we were just asking, we were just talking about um, but, uh, but Paulio, is, who is also trying to fix his audio connection now, uh, hopefully that works too. Uh, but Paulio has mentioned there's a broad understanding of culture and cultural heritage, actually. It's relation with social inclusion. Now, you have been working in different uh, countries and cities across the globe. I mean, what is your stance on the contribution of culture and cultural heritage to other areas of urban development, like social inclusion, uh, citizen participation, and these sort of issues. What is, your, what is your experience and what is your view on the importance of cultural and cultural heritage in that respect? Uh, well, um, I think here uh, um, we what what we are noticing is, and, and that's something I have, have noticed uh, in 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 my career at UNESCO, but also that we are noticing more globally, is that we have a lot of experience, a lot of good practices on these interlinkages, uh, the interlinkage between you know democratic participation, social inclusion, and how culture is actually a driver for this. But uh, uh, what we really lack is a, some more comprehensive, systematic approach on these issues. We seem to be in a constant kind of pioneering mode, <laughs> if I may say so. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, if I were to make suggestions on how to, to, to get kind of out of that deadlock, um, I think, uh, um, first of all, we have to use uh, 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 more uh, and try to really focus on the implementation of frameworks. Uh, I heard um, um, uh, uh, the other panelists referring to the FARO declaration. I mean, we have several frameworks that allows us to really unlock the potential of culture when it comes to uh, 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 urban development. Um, there is a FAO declaration. We at UNESCO, uh, we have in relation to the World Heritage Convention, which is probably has a very strong focus on the cultural heritage management aspect, but a broader recommendation that was adopted in 2011, which is called the Historic Urban Landscape Recommendation, and really seek to make these links between the stones and the people. Uh, the need for cultural heritage preservation uh, along, as you know, for World Heritage, very strict international standard, but at the same time, the, the, the acknowledgement that, uh, you know, a uh, um, um, historical uh, uh, city is, is a living and I dynamic environment where people have economic, social and cultural needs that needs to be taken into account. Um, so, so, so what I think is needed is first of all to make a more systematic use of these recommendations to encourage 
uh, more, more participation of all actors, including the cultural professions, uh, cultural heritage professions, but also more broadly the cultural professions in urban planning and development. Uh, so, so that would be my, my first take on that question. And then I think uh, um, a, a second point here is, is really then we have to, to document in a more systematic manner the contribution of culture to these various aspects of uh, sustainable development. And we have to document that not only at the country level, but really taking into account the specific dynamics that happen within a city. Um, so in that context, uh, uh, um, UNESCO has has developed a set of indicators, uh, which is called the Culture 2030 Indicators. Uh, and these indicators look at the contribution of culture to sustainable development in four thematic areas. One, environment and resilience, then prosperity, livelihoods, then knowledge and skills, and finally inclusion and participation. I think all this revolve around what we're discussing here today. Um, here, I, I hope you can see it. This yeah. is the framework of indicators. You can also find it online. I'd be happy to share the link with you. Uh, yeah, now, with support of the EU and Sweden, we are piloting uh, these indicators uh, in, in uh, six countries and including two countries in Europe, and that would be Romania and Portugal. And so they would be piloted at country level again, but also at city level in the capitals, in the two capitals. Um, this, I think it is important, uh, uh, not only for, for two reasons. First of all, to better, um, you know, inform urban policies and really have a sense of what is the concrete contribution today of culture to these various, what is so to say the social impact and economic impact at national but at country le at city level also uh, of culture. And then it is important for us to move forward and to have a more articulate discourse, a more precise, accurate discourse on what is the contribution of culture to sustainable development, because we missed a bit the train with the 2030 uh, uh, sustainable development goals. No specific goal on culture. Culture reflected in several goals, but still that the, 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 the strengths of culture, the, the potential of culture to contribute to sustainable development uh, uh, um, remains to be acknowledged and, 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 and more clearly framed. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for for establishing this link between culture, cultural heritage, and the environment, resilience, sustainable development, and also the SDGs, obviously. But could you give us a few examples of how culture and cultural heritage can concretely contribute to the SDGs, actually? Okay. Uh, so. Um... Let me take a concrete example and a, an example of a, a, a city uh, um, where um, needs are tremendous. I'm talking about the city of Mosul in Iraq. Uh, I had the chance of uh, serving as director of uh, the UNESCO office in Iraq before uh, coming here to Brussels in 2019. Um, and the city of Mosul, which has a very, a quite important um, uh, historical core, was destroyed 80% uh, during the conflict. Um, uh, at the same time, as in many, you know, post-conflict environments, uh, culture post-conflict or in general, I think that's exactly the discussion we're having today, culture is seen a little bit as on the margin, you know, some sort of thing you address when you have uh, dealt with the rest and the urgent humanitarian issues. Um, now, um, we, we thought that, you know, uh, uh, as, of course, as UNESCO, rebuilding, uh, uh, conserving what was left of the old city of Mosul was actually critical, not only as a cultural imperative, but as um, imperative of creating social cohesion in a city that had been a little bit become the symbol of all the tensions, uh, uh, the sectarian tensions uh, in Iraq, but also as an opportunity uh, in a country which 
uh, has a very high level of unemployment, uh, of uh, engaging uh, with, particularly with the young population, and provide and turning them into key actors of the reconstruction of their city. Um, not only through a participatory process in terms of consultation, uh, but really by providing them skills, skills in traditional uh, uh, building techniques, uh, and um, then providing them with jobs so that actually they would be the key physical actors uh, uh, of, of the reconstruction, why at the same time gaining a livelihood that would probably also allow themselves to rebuild their personal, uh, uh, um, uh, their houses and, 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 and so on. So, so that's one concrete example. This, this uh, program uh, is, is one that we're doing with the European Union, with, with DEVCO. Uh, and and uh, it, it, it seems that now there is um, an understanding within the European institutions and more broadly in Europe that, you know, culture is, is not just a very specific technical field, culture and heritage preservation. It is really one that has a much broader and concrete contribution to uh, uh, um, social development, livelihoods, job creation, uh, social cohesion. Yeah, thank you, Louise. And indeed, I mean, very, very convincing example of how culture and cultural heritage can actually play a role. Um, let's let's move to Paulius. Jan Maarten, let us uh, let me go over to you uh, to, to, to ask some follow-up questions. Actually, let's, 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 let's improvise a little bit. This whole we need to, experience, exactly, uh, yeah. Maybe checking, checking the resilience of your technology in OSU. There's a lot going on in the chat and while listening very carefully and at the same time exactly. looking at it, there is a real dilemma that I think uh, is, is, is coming up in at least my head. We heard already uh, from, 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 from a distinguished professor that culture runs, and also from Paulus, is runs deep. It is intangible. And I wrote down, it's almost about our soul, right? But then we also want culture to contribute to all those other things. And we want to measure it. We need to measure it. We need data. We heard that very, very much so. So uh, perhaps a question to you, Paul, is first, how can we, how can we measure the unmeasurable? It seems we need to measure because if we don't measure, then culture becomes relevant or irrelevant or it is not taken seriously or it is marginalized or it is muted. <laughs> So, uh, how do you approach that? Uh, uh, can we measure and should we measure culture? Uh, uh, what is your thinking? Can you hear me now? Yes, Super we can. Cool. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I will uh, answer your question with the question, young Martin. Why should we measure it? Now, because, you see, if, if we look from that perspective where you started, Yes. Yeah, well, it, it, it's in the chat very good. Then let's measure the chat um, uh, in, in the number of words or, 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 or you know, symbols or width or breadth. Now, the, now, we are here also in a different kind of tension huh? because, now, as you say, we need to be pragmatic. Yeah? Now, it, it has to bring some results which have to be measurable. On the one hand, on the other hand, we have this conceptual issue of of um, uh, culture, which which is not just a commodity, which is not just an artistic expression, but which is something that defines, in 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 large part, the identity. Mm -hmm. So, I think the answer in this is in what has been presented today by Jan Schulthuis as a Pentagon. Uh, because there we can see uh, this uh, connection between pragmatism uh, and, 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 and the conceptual uh, uh, construct where you are going to bring your partnership further. Because uh, yeah, but I understand, as also as Mr. Poppin said, you know, when they're doing the programming at the European Commission, they have to bring in something concrete. 
But uh, I am not sure that uh, if you take, take cultural heritage. Now let's take the world. I mean, yeah, we looked at, uh, Louise mentioned uh, Mosul. Now, let's look at uh, Sri Lanka. Hmm? How have they used their cultural heritage as an attractor to tourists? And that you can mention in arrivals, in dollars spent per capita, per, uh, per time. But did, it, did the approach to cultural heritage help resolve the problem of several identities in the, in the island? No, because it was only looked at as something that can bring the dollar which can create jobs, which... So, so that is why I think this, this pragmatism can also be uh, dangerous if it is not bringing in uh, the, the deep understanding. Okay, I have to be fair, I have to answer. So I think there is one side of this which we can measure, and we'll be always be measuring the tangibles of the results. But that does not mean that the other side, the conceptual and the paradigmatic side, is important. So, uh, using the chance that my microphone still works, I was asking myself a question also. So, okay, if we look from the global, from the international dimension to this partnership, what can be learned? And that is... That is, that is one of the three elements that I think is very important because from the outset, this partnership tried to retain the balance of the both sides. And, uh, the need to improve the regulations, the funding, the knowledge, information, getting practical, doing something concrete, but not forgetting the deeper uh, dimension of culture and the need that it is to be considered in strategic, in, in, in territorial dimension. You know, when we look at the uh, Pentagon, I mean, that's where it is, the fostering a broader understanding, promoting integrated approaches from social inclusion to territorial cohesion, and so forth, uh, so, uh, and so forth. Okay. But also, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's super interesting, and I'm sure your microphone will work also today and the rest of tomorrow. But <laughs> I, I'm really, really intrigued by uh, by this point, and and perhaps you know, uh, Marta, if you allow me to push through this uh, yeah, a little yeah. bit further, also by posing the same question to Professor Hospital, and also looking at the chat, there are questions, and people say, well, we need to measure somehow because culture is competing with other domains, and. Perhaps uh, the, the example of the day is every morning or every evening we look at the COVID statistics. We know exactly, you know, the numbers of cases, of people hospitalized and, and casualties. But we do not necessarily know a lot of other things which are important, which are uh, intangible. And culture is, is, is one of them. So uh, in, that, in that fight, in a dilemma that Pauli has commented on as well, and, and that Louise, uh, you know, uh, rightly tapped into, uh, how do you how you to take that? How does culture need to de almost defend itself in this world? And what is the the the, the, the strategy that you would recommend there uh, to actually strengthen uh, the case for culture? Because we heard already how important it is, how much it contributes to other domains, including sustainable development. Um, I, I believe that the strategy of the urban agenda is uh, very well uh, chosen and uh, adapted to the situation and to the interest of, of cultural heritage because we do not need, I think, an additional promotion program for cultural heritage, but we should like, we should try to involve it in all the promotion programs and in the uh, public funding to say that cultural heritage is not only a part of, uh, of, of development and of promotion programs, but it should uh, be a, a partner from the beginning 
of this process to uh, include cultural heritage and experts of cultural heritage in, uh, in structuring this kind of programs and not to think uh, last and least there is cultural heritage when we have already defined the programs, the criteria uh, and, and the way of, of, of funding, but we should try to include it very early and to find what it has been called an integrated approach to all kinds of development and part of the integration, and we think that the central, a crucial part of this integration is cultural heritage because it can be used as a, as a driver, as a motor of, of development and a second aspect is I do, I'm not sure how it can be measured uh, or if it should be measured. Because the first question was, how, what can cultural heritage contribute, for example, for well-being? That's very difficult to measure. It's easier to measure the, 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 the stays of, of tourists, uh, their arrivals, the beds, uh, and, and things like this. This is measurable. But all the other kinds which are very important because of its quality, it's more difficult. And what is the, 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 the chance or the, the potential of cultural heritage is that it brings people together. It brings people together to cooperate, to communicate, and to uh, is, it is encouraging to, for example, in the situation of recovering uh, bombed and uh, war-destroyed uh, cities, or also in recovering uh, after a crisis time. So that is that is the, the potential of, uh, of heritage to bring people together and to force or to promote collaboration. That is why I think it's more important that it is mainstreamed in all the programs, the cultural heritage, and that it is not looked upon as an additional uh, instrument, for example. And there is a second aspect when we discuss the question of sustainable development. Uh, I think that the cultural heritage offers a kind of um, of learning field how to deal with uh, with tangible heritage of the past because it has survived since generation and it is uh, it's an example for uh, for a kind of crisis management as it, it has been used so it could be used also uh, as a as a kind of resource which has survived because people take care of it, because they try to avoid to, uh, to, uh, to, to waste or to produce building rubble, to, uh, to destruct it and to replace it, but they have tried to continuously to build it. And when we discuss this term of Baukultur, which may be as famous and as un uh, possible to be uh, translated as the kindergarten, we think that Baukultur is not only uh, a sense of cultural heritage, it is a kind of an, an, a specific approach towards the environment that is to keep it and to take care of the stock, of the cultural stock which is there, and to keep it and not only to think about listed, for example, about listed monuments, but, but about the, the treatment of the heritage and of the, of the resources in general. There was an exhibition uh, at the German pavilion in Venezia at the Architektur Biennale 2012, which was called um, reduce, reuse, and recycling. And that is a programmatic approach to think about how have we to deal not only listed monuments and sites and monuments of art and history, but in general, how can we deal with the world? And we do not only need respect to our heritage or to the cultural properties, but we need a culture of building, preserving, and of Baukultur that is based on the existing buildings, and a culture of conserving and of continuing this historic stock. And this is the role of cultural heritage, I think. It's not the heritage itself, it's our attitude, or it's the, the culture of how to preserve cultural heritage, which can be used as a, as a model, maybe, also to deal with other uh, with the other building stock and as a laboratory uh, to sustainable development. Thanks so much. Uh, perhaps uh, may I pose one question to, to Louise and then perhaps Marts, it would be good if you check then the, the chat for the remaining 10 minutes because a lot yeah. of things are going on. But somehow, uh, and thank you so much for, I mean, I, I wrote on mainstreaming, culture needs to be used to mainstream and also 
the link with uh, circular economy, reduce, reuse, recycle is so important. But while you were speaking, I was having in my mind this image of Mosul. I've not been to Mosul, but I've seen, of course, the awful uh, <laughs> pictures on the television last year, the year before already. So, I mean, I would have a very simple question to Louise. You know, now we are so many people here discussing European culture in these crazy times. But what would it, would it be anything from the type of work that we do here in this European bubble on culture and cultural heritage that we could bring to the city of Mosul that would help the restoration, that would help uh, make the people perhaps more proud of the city? Is there any element of the discussion here or the action plan where you see well, that is something I can really export or use that in a such different context as the one in Mosul? Please, can we checking again whether I hope we can hear you? No, she's muted. I think you're muted. Uh... Someone muted her. Yeah. Organizers, perhaps you can also unmute uh, Luis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, good, yes. oh great. Um, yeah, uh, I think there is um, looking at Mosul, but um, but also you know at, at, at other cities, um, um, particularly in 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 the Middle East that have been uh, you know severely affected by conflict. I think we here in Europe have had a bit of a similar experience. Um, I remember uh, when I was uh, in Iraq having particularly interesting discussions uh, 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 with uh, Germany, with German experts, with uh, the German uh, embassy, uh, also with Poland, um, you know, where countries where we have had cities who were heavily uh, uh, destroyed uh, after, um, uh, during the Second World War. Uh, and I think uh, the type um, of, of experience, I, I must say, one of the most interesting interactions was actually between a group of um, Polish experts and, uh, and people from Mosul, who I think for a lot of people in Mosul, the whole idea of possibility of reconstructing the city seemed impossible seemed just impossible and you know uh, the alternative that was really on the table at that time was let's just destroy what remains of that fantastic old city and make a new dubai instead it's going to be much easier um and that was why we had this extremely interesting exchange with uh, a, a polish expert who first of all uh, i think showed that it is possible to reconstruct. And I think that a lot of European countries have that experience. We know that it is possible, and it's very important to convey that message. Um, and um, also the importance of actually reconstructing, conserving, uh, uh, trying to get back to, to, uh, uh, to, to what the city was, uh, not as a nostalgia, but really because it is healing. It is something that uh, uh, has the power of bringing uh, hope to people, uh, of, of, of bringing, um, uh, of reconnecting people uh, and of making people pride of their country, of their identity, but in a broad sense. Uh, also, um, because, um, I mean, when we think about w what is the particularity of the identity of a city, any city, it is that the city is a place of coexistence. And particularly in countries uh, uh, where you have, you know, sectarian divides and so on, cities are actually the symbol of that coexistence. So if it is impossible to reconstruct a city, then it becomes impossible to have coexistence. So there is a lot of emotionally charged uh, uh, symbolic dimension to the resilience of cities, if we go beyond, you know, the post-conflict context, uh, um, that um, is maybe not so tangible as, as said by others. Although I, 
I believe we at UNESCO believe that we should try to find ways of documenting, of measuring uh, 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 these kind of less tangible uh, dimension of what cultural heritage conservation and protection. Thank you so much for, I mean, this, this very, very useful insights. Healing and hope are wrote down as well. Uh, thank you so much. Meanwhile, Mark, I see the, the chat is so much in there. Have you been able to have a look? And we still have about yes. five minutes right before we wrap up for the lunch. Uh, what sticks out yeah. in your mind uh, and when reading the chat? Uh, and is there anything to, well, to ask about the, the panelists? So, yeah. Well, what I see is that there are a bit of a, I mean, the, the chat is now also currently used a lot to uh, to share information, which is also one of the uh, uh, great functionalities of a chat, of course. So I would really like uh, to advise the participants to have a look at the chat and to to uh, to copy the uh, the links that are given by different uh, uh, participants and also panelists. Uh, to provide additional information. I see there's a bit of a discussion, not directly, but about the need for measuring, for evaluating. Uh, Louise has shared also some UNESCO reports, um, but indeed, uh, I also note that uh, some people, and, and Paulius was one of the, uh, let's say, the speakers, uh, mentioning also that pragmatism uh, it can be an enemy also uh, dealing with this topic of culture and cultural heritage. So there is a bit of a, a struggle in the chat also about the need to measure, to evaluate, to monitor uh, the contribution of culture and cultural heritage to society. And on the other hand, uh, to to treat it differently in a way. You mean not to, to because not everything can be expressed also in in, the, in 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 numbers. Even though we do live in competitive society and funds uh, needs to be shared, of course. So I think this is a bit of a debate, and perhaps we can ask the panelists to reflect a bit about uh, to reflect a bit about the need to measure to 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 compete also in our societies. On the other hand how culture and cultural heritage in a way stand out and can or need perhaps to be um, uh, taken out of that, the, the, the risk of too much pragmatism or let's say, uh, to put it differently, uh, too far reaching neoliberal approach where every, everything can be capitalized. Um, may I perhaps start in that sense with, um, uh, with Professor Haspel, what is your stance on that? Um, I, I think, of course, uh, the cultural heritage is a, a competing uh, issue or sector compared to others, and so it is necessary also to to have um, a, a measurement. But I'm not sure how the the criteria, how they can be defined, which are corrected. That is why we we need a special way to measure this uh, this the efforts and also the money which has been given out. And I think the um, a main issue for cultural heritage is to look upon or beyond the cultural heritage, beyond the monument to the people, to the society which is involved and which is responsible. So the effect of cultural heritage is not the, the best restoration or the best craftsmanship itself. It is how it can be, for example, given to people, to, uh, to education, in, in craftsmanship, to, to keep the monuments, to um, do the monitoring by themselves, not by the UNESCO and not by the EU or, or by others, but by the local community and to qualify them that, so that they can improve their uh, self uh, responsibility for the cultural heritage and that is my main issue I think we have to uh, to empower people to become the owner of their cultural heritage and also to make sure that it is can be continuously given to the next uh, generation and if I may add the example of Mosul is wonderful and many of the sites which have been destroyed by civil wars or by wars uh, in the Near East they are very good examples that rest restoration or rebuilding of historic towns is part of recovering the souls of healing the souls and of recreating communities which are cooperating in this in this 
field. And that is why it is worth to think about cultural heritage as a, a, a very important movement or movements for this uh, whole development. Thank you for that observation, Professor Hasbro. I see that Paulius Kulikauskas uh, actually raised his hands in support of your statement. Paulius, could you explain that in, in verbal uh, ways also? Yeah, well, mostly I raised uh, my index finger. Uh, <laughs> All right. that, that is a very good point. Well, I, I don't really want to go back to, 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 to the issue of measuring because, I mean, there's, there's, there's this natural duality, as we talked about, where we have culture as uh, identity on one side and uh, uh, culture as a driver of economy, if you wish, or whatever, on the other side, and one can be measured in one way and another one in another way. But I think it is very important that we, we, we are forgetting this now. I, th I think, although it will be true of all partnerships, but one thing that we at UN Habitat have been observing is this inclusive, in, in working inclusively across all levels and sectors of, of the multi-level, multi-stakeholder governance. So uh, if, if, if there is one thing that I will have to take back from, from all this uh, work of the urban agenda for the EU, and in particular on such a complicated and rich subject as culture, uh, is, this, uh, is this way of working. Because the complex issues are best addressed together. And also Professor Haskell mentioned the issue of community. I don't think you could have uh, addressed and achieved the results that you have achieved only by having a group of experts and civil servants and politicians. So uh, I think that is the, the, the lesson that is most important and we try to bring it back. I post it in the chat and uh, we can take it from yeah, we will share the chat afterwards, obviously, with all the participants. Uh, but Louise, uh, perhaps some final words you with your huge experience in different cities across the globe what is your major takeaway from our discussion that by the way was appreciated a lot by some of the participants i also noticed that in the chat but please what is your takeaway your own takeaway okay well i think uh yeah of course pragmatism and of course you know cities uh, we cannot ask cities to 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 kind of find solutions to 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 every 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 problem uh, but um i think um going back to the data issue we have to realize that uh, the, you know, measuring the impact of culture and development is actually not a new activity. The thing is, until very recently, the way culture's contribution to development was measured was only its economic contribution. What is changing now with the sustainable development agenda is because of the focus on sustainability that has all these other elements, not only of, you know, immediate economic gains, but really look at how we are going to survive on this planet, given the, you know, the, 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 the climate uh, 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 change uh, that is affecting us, given the tension. I mean, all these, these global challenges we are facing. Um, in fact, culture has a lot to do there too. And I think uh, it may be challenging, but it would be a pity if we just continue to measure culture's contribution only to economic development or cultural tourism uh, in particular. Uh, we, there is really a moment with this shift in vision of our development and the focus on sustainability to capture a whole, the whole range of uh, 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 culture and cultural heritage contribution to our societies, to the development here in Europe, beyond, in very different contexts. Thank you very much, Louise. I think indeed that it is the, one of the key messages of today that uh, culture and cult cultural heritage do contribute in a really wide array of activities and, and aspects to, uh, to urban life. Uh, and not just urban life, but also life in general, I would say. 
With these uh, last words, I'd like to give the floor back to you, Jan Marte, to make some announcements okay. because indeed it's almost time for a lunch break, right? It's, it's almost time for a lunch break. Uh, uh, just one thought before, because uh, in a way it may be because the sun is still shining in Brussels, which is rare in a November day, and maybe uh, having an impact on my uh, mood. But I think what I really take from this morning session is that, you know, we actually can be pretty lucky. Uh, in, in our European setting, because when we go out uh, uh, for lunch, when we go out into our towns, even in these very, very difficult times, you know, our, our, our cultural heritage is still there, unlike in some other cities that we heard about, unlike many cities in the world that are directly threatened also by natural disasters. We have not talked much about natural disasters, but we hear more about it after lunch, because, of course, a lot of cultural heritage is also there threatened by climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a very positive note, you know, it, unlike a, we often comparing the, 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 the current pandemic to the time of war. It's, it's, of course, not that bad because, you know, one of the reasons our cities will be still as beautiful as they are. Of course, we need to be reinventing ourselves. The people, the artists we mentioned, you know, are suffering no big deal. But it seems really needed to connect to the broader debate, to the broader discussion. And I think if there's one term that comes up constantly in this debate where I think we can connect to, it is resilience. So if we can demonstrate that culture is so important for the resilience of people, places, cities, communities, then I think uh, we have definitely demonstrated that this morning. So thank you very much for with, with, being with us all the time. It's now 12.06 in Berlin, and it's also 12.06 in the Netherlands and in Brussels. And uh, we had a deal, which is that we would start, uh, try to stick to the time. So, yes, we'll start at one o'clock, which gives almost an hour lunch break to stretch your legs to do the necessary. And we will go into the actions this afternoon. The actions, which will be going into groups. We, we will start plenary. We will hear uh, from various distinguished um, uh, participants of the action plan uh, on the various strategies, various pillars, as we heard them already at one o'clock. So you are okay to keep uh, the Webex on because some of you struggled, many of us struggled to do that. Please mute and turn your camera off. Also when coming back, it's always nice to see you, but we want to have particular focus on the speakers panelists. So I think, having said that, I think a very, very big applause, I would say for our panelists. We don't make very much noise when we are muted, but feel free to do so. Many thanks for you having opened our eyes. Uh, have a very good lunch. Thanks, Mart. Thanks, organizers. Yes. Clap. And see you back at Bonnet. Here we clap, yeah, indeed, with some blue from the background. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. And have a good lunch. And see you back in a bit less than one hour at one o'clock, exactly. Okay.